Message is being broadcast by the Department of Defense of the Republic. At 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, multiple unidentified objects were confirmed to have entered Earth's atmosphere. The first message that comes to you is you are a divine being. You matter. You count. You come from realms of unimaginable power and light, and you will return to those realms. The vast stretches of the unknown and the unanswered and the unfinished still far outstripped our collective comprehension. Broadcasting from Forest Tower Studios, all the way from the Deep South. Now, here is your host, Joe Rubin. And we are broadcasting on a hill in a shack in the Mossy Creek bottoms of Cane Creek, Arkansas. This is Lighting the Void, and I'm your host, Joe Rubin. Welcome. It is Wednesday night, November the 13th, on into the 14th. And uh, we're going to go back and take a look, a hard look at the out-of-body experience along with connecting some more dots here with Graham Nichols tonight. Born in London and an author, he's uh, had some uh, visions, some clairvoyant perceptions, and uh, is kind of well-known for his out-of-body experience stories on YouTube as well. You can go check those out. The website for reference tonight is going to be GrahamNichols.com. And that's with two L's on the end. So GrahamNichols.com. We'll drop the links in the chat room. Thank you guys for joining us. We are live on the Fringe FM, KTLK Digital Broadcasting. And don't forget, we're here for you five nights a week. Five nights a week, 9 p.m. Pacific to midnight. And uh, next week, Thursday night and Friday night, we're going to do some uh, best of. I might go live somehow from the phone because I'm going to be in Portland. So... If you guys are in Portland or if you want to uh, give me a shout, anybody up there in the Pacific Northwest in the area, come give me a holler. Also, don't forget to go to the contact page and click on that speak pipe button and uh, tell you tell everybody why you're a void walker. We got some more in, and I can't wait to air this. I, I was going to air it today, but some big uh, emergencies came up, so I didn't really get a chance to edit that. But, man, it is awesome, all of you guys that have been putting that in there. And uh, Jared made the creed, and, and you know, and that's pretty cool that the listeners made the creed. I'll always, uh, man, I'll always be appreciative of that. And uh, he, I think it was his wife that said thank you for that too on Facebook. So really cool. Yeah, so just go to the contact page on lightingthevoid.com, hit that orange button on SpeakPipe, and you can uh, just say your name, where you're from, and that you're a void walker. You can even say the creed now that it's up on the Facebook page. And I even put that picture up um you know, on the front page there. Pretty cool, man. And uh, if you want to leave a shout-out for promos, too, because I love mixing that stuff. All right, this show is brought to you by GetTheTea.com. Right now is the opportune time to get that winter special they have. You need that. That's It's probably what's keeping me from getting sick, because I've had a few colds come on, but they just go away. And i got to think it's this coral sea and the tea that I'm taking. Also, AncientLifeOil.com. No. It is not, um, what do you call it? The, um, someone told me that it was psychosomatic. The CBD oil is psychosomatic. Wrong answer. Go check out your research on that. And and for the love of God, if you're going to get it, get it from ancientlifeoil.com. Prepare with friends.com. Don't get caught unawares. You might get hit with a 220-pound meteor in your town. Y'all saw that, right? That thing went right over the archways of, uh, or the arch in St. Louis. So when that thing hit... Yeah, it's doing some damage. I don't know that uh, it damaged anything in the city, but that was pretty impressive. It seems like those meteors are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger as time goes along. We talked about that earlier this year, if y'all remember, so keep an eye out for that. Okay, so uh, the archives are caught up. They're totally caught up. Last night's show, Craig Williams, I want to thank him for coming on. Very cool guy, man. I mean, I honestly thought I wasn't going to agree with him on a lot of things just because... You see that left-hand path type thing there, and you go, nah, you know, 
there's probably going to be some stuff that I don't agree with you on. And yet I agreed with him on everything. It was a fantastic conversation. And, uh, yeah, I hope he comes back. So I want to thank him for coming out too. Tomorrow night on the program, Claude Swanson is going to be on the broadcast, which is going to be another one. I mean, this week has just been packed full of really great guests. And, you know, Dr. Claude Swanson was educated as a physicist at MIT. And, uh, you know, he's got some pretty pretty cool experiences to talk about as well as of his research. So, man, I can't wait. I cannot wait. But this guy, Graham Nichols, you guys have probably heard about him. Very interesting story. And I think it's time that we talk to him. The first time he's been on the program and, you know, it ain't just going to be about the out of body experience. You notice I said ain't. I'm, pr- I'm probably the only radio jock out there that says the word ain't. If y'all going to find another one? Let me know. So let's bring on our guest. Graham Nichols is an author and artist born in London, England. From a young age, he underwent various unusual experiences, including visions, clairvoyant perceptions, and then later out of body experiences. He first came to the public attention as an artist exploring psychology and consciousness through specially designed technological environments, the largest of which was exhibited at London Science Museum in 2004. And more recently, he has focused on writing. With the publication of Avenues of the Human Spirit, his first book, and Navigating the Out-of-Body Experience, following soon after 2012. Over the last decade, he has lectured widely on his spiritual, social, and uh, physical, or psychical, physical, no, psychical viewpoints, sorry, both in the UK and abroad at venues such as Cambridge University, the London College of Spirituality, the Theosophical Society, and the Science Museum. After more than 24 years and hundreds of -of out-of-body experiences, also sometimes called astral projection, quote, right, he is a leading expert on the subject. He has conducted scientific experiments into telepathy and precognition with author and biologist Rupert Sheldrake as part of the the Parrot Wart Project, supported by the Trinity College, Cambridge. And look, and once again, the website, GrahamNichols.com, two L's on the end. Graham, it's awful early over there uh, in uh, the England area, so we really do appreciate you coming on here. This is the most important subject of Lighting the Void. Thank you so much for coming on the show. No problem. It's really great to be here. Did you have an out-of-body experience before before you woke up? <laughs> no, not Not this morning, no. Oh, good. Well, tell me um, a little bit about yourself, because this is the first time, man, I've ever got to talk to you. I really like your website, and what I'm really kind of interested in, um, and I think I've only talked to one other person that might be close. I have no idea how you guys come up with this stuff, but you've done some experiments with uh, tech to try to, I'm, I'm assuming, and maybe you can correct me here, to enhance this state of the out-of-body experience. Am I right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's... that's uh... I've been working on that since the late 90s. So, yeah, that's been a big area for a long time. What works good? Besides, uh, you know, everybody's into binaural beats or hemisync. What have you found that also triggers this other than that? I've explored everything. I've I've pretty much looked into every area of um, uh, technology that could that could help, really. I, I guess I started off with hypnosis, looking at whether hypnotic states could help with out-of-body experiences. Then I looked into uh, sensory deprivation, um, the work of John Zubeck, um, who did 15 years of research into all kinds of different sensory deprivation. So I, I looked into that and I found that certain types of sensory deprivation can be helpful um, which is backed up in other research, like uh, the uh, work into telepathy. So there's areas like the Gansfeld experiments that use a mild form of sensory deprivation to enhance psychic ability. Um, then there's people like uh, Michael Persinger in Canada who passed away quite recently. He also worked with magnetic uh, magnetic frequencies across the brain, so he also uh, looked at ways that you could enhance psychic abilities. He came up with a particular configuration he called the octopus configuration, uh, where he would use these solenoids over the brain to try and enhance uh, remote viewing, for example. Wow. So there's so many areas, really. And then I've worked with my with sound frequencies. So I, I didn't find 
personally that binaural beats were very effective for me. I found that um, sound could be effective, but it needed to be um, different types of sound. So I worked a lot with that as well. And I came up with infraliminal sound, which is uh, part infrasound and part subliminal. So hence infraliminal, mixing the two uh, technologies together and uh, combining that with structures that would, for example, lift you off of the ground and help give you this uh, sensation as if you were floating. So lots and lots of different areas, basically. I've been working with this actually since 1987. So, wow. Man, that is impressive. Congratulations on that. And and you've, you've trademarked that too, the infra liminal, right? It looks that way. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, um, that's, uh, another, another thing that I work with. Yeah. So the the on your website, if you click on infraliminal, there's a thing that talks about uh, the history of this. And see, I'm totally new to this. I have no, I'm not going to lie to you, Graham. I have no idea what this means uh, or what it involves. And so if you don't mind, I'm sure you've talked about it a million times, but I would love to hear just, a, you know, the layman's version of how this works. Um. Well, there's been a whole range of research into uh, infrasound, for example. Um, a lot of the, the skeptical community, for example, um, believe that infrasound is a way of triggering different v- perceptions. For example, houses that have natural infrasound, often people report uh, ghost experiences, for example. Um, so I became interested in this. Is this some way of sort of triggering possibly psychic ability or or maybe um, different kinds of perceptions. So I started experimenting with low level frequencies. Infrasound is basically the inaudible sort of level, the very, very low level uh, sound frequencies. Um, okay. So I started working with that as an alternative to, to things like hemisync, as I mentioned, it didn't hemisync, I, I often feel quite relaxed when I listen to Hemisync, but it doesn't um, lead me to the kinds of states that I wanted. And I wanted a, a reliable way that I could get people, for example, to the vibrational state. Now, the vibrational state is one of the common uh, transitional early stages of the outer body experience. A lot of people think it's the only one, but that's not true. There's actually a range of different transitional states, including what I call a void state, um, which is sort of a not unpleasant, but a kind of, uh, dark, no, no visual element to it. It's, it's like a sort of primary consciousness you could maybe say, okay. and, and that often arises into an outer body experience. Then there's things like uh, noises, sounds, buzzing, clicking, things like that that often are precursors to outer body experiences. Some people get more like floating sensations and they don't necessarily get uh, a vibration. So there's a whole range of early stages. But I, I, for me, it's a kind of mild vibrational state that I often get pre the outer body experience. So I looked at my own brain waves and looked at if I played certain frequencies, what would happen. So so pretty much we did like trial and error over a period of years um, and tried to work out what frequencies might trigger different brain states um, or different similar kinds of states and eventually developed the, the infraliminal version one, which is the main one I use and the main one on my website. Um, and that one is designed to get you to that vibrational state, which is basically the launch pad for the outer body experience from there. It's, uh, simple techniques can be used to initiate the, the full experience. So there's also been a whole range of other benefits that have come out of this. For example, um, a man in Ireland called Eamon, um, started working with the sound frequencies with people with, uh, severe addictions like drug addictions um and found that when when the person listened to the sound for a period of time it would it would help them uh, deal with their own uh, struggles and their own addictions it was basically like a way of giving them um a deep trance experience without them having to do all the learning process so they would get to this point where they would get into a 
into basically a positive sort of healing state. And I actually went to Ireland and I met um, one man who had been working with my sound, with the infraliminal sound, and he's pretty much turned his life around. He was he was addicted to a level of drugs that would kill the average person, and he was taking that on a daily basis. Um, and within within a few a uh, few weeks, basically, he he'd had positive changes in his life. And when I met him, he was about to apply for for college and to you know really turn his life around. So. It's been a whole journey with the infraliminal sound. It's like so many areas have opened up through it. Man, I am, I'm all about this because new technology to enhance this is, is great. That's, and it's not really, I guess I I wouldn't say it's new. You've been working on it for a long time. It's been experimented, I guess, uh, by John Zubik past in the past. And you've kind of put all this together. And I can tell you right now that my audience is very interested in this kind of stuff because, um, the faster you can get to these states, I guess I wouldn't say the faster, but let's say, well, does it make you get there faster? Is it just more, um, successful at it? What you would say, I'm assuming. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm not a person who's, he's about faster. I, I do, I do generally think it's best to learn it in a, in a systematic way. Um, but I think that we, we often waste a lot of time going in, in pointless directions, I guess we could say. Mm-hmm. Um, and with, with the, with the aid of the sound, it can guide you basically to get to that point in a more direct way rather than, um, going off in, you know, dif- in the wrong direction. So I, I guess you could say it kind of, um, focuses your, your practice. So that that's kind of where it's beneficial. Now I want to get, pretty deep into this subject here with you but of course first i'd like to ask you because it's the first time i've ever spoken to you that were you just curious about this subject or did you have you did from my understanding you had out-of-body experiences as a child right and this is uh or when you were younger and then you started kind of noticing things now i could i could be wrong but uh i looked at some of your older interviews on youtube and you were talking about that, and uh, could could you uh, correct me on that though, if I'm wrong, please? No, that's that's correct. My my experiences started actually probably around four or five, but not out of body experiences. At about four four or five, they were more, I guess you could say, visionary and possibly reincarnation memories but unfortunately they weren't recorded so i i those memories faded with time so i don't now recall much of of what i what i was perceiving back then but yeah but what i do remember at five i think it was about five i've always felt intuitively that i was about five when this happened i had an experience of an apparition um but when I say an apparition, this wasn't just like a ghost. This was like a, this was like a kind of a being, um, that was like standing at a threshold. Um, so I literally, uh, walked into the hallway of the, the, the apartment I grew up in. Um, and I saw this quite terrifying in a sense because I didn't know what it was, but, um, quite, almost shamanic I would say it, it seemed to be wearing kind of rags or, or or like feathers or something like that and it had a kind of long mask kind of thing on it uh, it was wearing so um it it's obviously I was very scared at that age and yeah. I went down onto onto the ground and was kind of uh you know trying to get some solidity from uh, out of fear really um and I just didn't really know what it was and it just stood there and there seemed to be like a a sense of expanse or space behind it. Like it was literally, and it it was standing in the doorway. So the doorway that led out into the hall of the apartment building that I grew up in. So it was very, it was literally standing at a threshold sort of symbolically. So um, it had a really profound effect on me. And, and after that, a lot of things started to happen. I would have my what I would consider maybe mild psychic perceptions and things like that and that slowly increased over time and then when I reached about 12 was when things really 
started to um, get more more profound. I had my first out of body experiences, which were spontaneous, and while always while I was awake, I've never really had sleep out of body experiences. I know a lot of people make that assumption, um, but right. that's actually, actually not even true in terms of the the research into people who have out of body experiences. The majority actually in studies are often not asleep um th- these are these have become sort of internet myths really that certain things have been spread that it's always asleep and like lucid dreaming or whatever but that's more of a recent thing uh especially in the older research it was 70 plus percent of people were having out of body experiences from a waking conscious state um so that was the case with me and I and I found myself um, around h- half a mile, something like that, from where I grew up, um, just literally floating um, upright. So it was almost like I was standing a few feet above the ground, and I would just be standing in the street somewhere half a mile from from where my physical body was. And at the time, I I had no idea what what this meant or what this was. I'd never heard of an out-of-body experience. There was no religion in my background. There was no interest in paranormal topics. My parents were very sort of ordinary, down-to-earth, working-class people. Um, So, yeah, I just started having these very transformative experiences. And um, then then around a, a year after that, roughly i i heard of an out of body experience for the first time and realized that was what was happening to me um and i remember literally one day just going out to go to one of the main shopping areas in london near oxford street where there's loads and loads of shops and i i just decided to go there to go to the bookshops and try and find some information on on this uh, topic and i found a small book a scientifically focused book on uh, out of body experiences and that was really the turning point that was when i then devoted myself for the next 6 months and i managed to induce intentionally um an out of body experience and then after that it became much much easier to induce the experiences on wow. a regular basis okay thank you for sharing that so yeah, so you're telling me a little different than most people do. Most people that have come on the program have told me that this state is just a a different level of consciousness, so to speak. And and I've always wondered about that, and I still stay a bit confused because the one time that I did have an out-of-body experience where I saw myself sleeping and everything was extremely vivid and it was like real time, you know, um, it did not feel like a dream at all at all um it was something totally different i will never forget especially maybe it was just the first time but i've never had another one quite like that one and i think hearing you talk about it is probably what you were experiencing the same thing i can i'm betting yeah those early experiences were well they they were life-changing because i i I'd never experienced anything like it. And, and like you say, it was nothing like a dream. It was um, the very first ones. I, it was literally like I was standing floating in midair. Probably if I <laughs> if I hadn't returned to my body, I probably would have believed that suddenly I'd developed the ability to fly or something. You know, it was just right. this or float. It was just this really um, ultra realistic in many ways the experiences are not always like that but sometimes they have this ultra realistic quality where they're almost more realistic than than being physically somewhere um i'm shut i'm slightly short-sighted in reality so sometimes in the out-of-body experiences that's not the case and my vision is hyper crystal focused so yeah so it's it's it definitely had a profound effect and when i had that first induced out of body experience that was also well i I had this sensation of electricity that it not in a painful way it was very positive and pleasant but i had it but it was as intense as i would imagine feeling an electric shock a very powerful electric shock would be um 
but in a positive way. And it just went through my body and sort of shot me into the air, basically. And I was then looking down at myself. And I remember the um, feeling of like elation, really, that I'd, I'd finally achieved it um, in an induced way. And also I was um, just amazed at what I was seeing, although it was a very simple scene. I was just looking back at myself laying in bed and I could see the the light coming through the window and I was just sort of looking around the room. Um, it was so real and so um, full of energy and, and life that even something as simple as that had had this completely mind blowing feeling about it. Yeah. The, you know, you talk about the vibratory state uh, and well, I want to say this too first you're totally right about sleeping like and you've had many of these experiences this was just one for me but I wasn't asleep I mean I was actually uh, I woke myself up at the old trick where you wake yourself up at early in the morning so you're more relaxed and then mm -hmm. listening to a guided tape uh, and just kind of set up and was like well you know damn it didn't work right and I, I said I'm gonna sit up I'm gonna wait till I get to the vibratory state and I waited for that and it, it just felt like a, I don't know, like a wave of electricity that was real kind of uh, like that numbing feeling when you, your hand's asleep or something, but more electrified. And when it was over, I just kind of sat up and I was like, I guess it didn't work. That's how real it felt, you know. And um, <laughs> I, could, I turned around and saw myself and I was like, I, I can't describe the feeling, Graham, of what I was like, you know, this is real. This is real. You know, this is... Uh, this is no joke. And I was, I went out, you know, the first thing I did was go outside and fly into a tree, but that was, um, that changed my life too. So let me ask you this then. When people say you go out of body every night, I hear this from guest after guest. We all go out of body every night. We just don't recall doing it. Do you agree with that? Well, this is probably where I differ from most people on this topic because I take the approach of a scientist when it comes to this. So when someone says a statement like that, my, my first thought is, do we, what is the evidence? What's the basis for thinking that? Um, so I then try to try to sort of uncover where, where this kind of idea originates, if it's based on anything, we, anything with any substance, and so with, with a question like that, I think I think actually it's unlikely because we're not we're not really seeing any signs of that in terms of the experience of of people and in terms of like recollections and anything like that. I think if we were really having an OBE literally every night and if we're talking about that, it's happening while we're asleep, then that would mean possibly multiple times in a night we were having an experience. I feel that there would be more signs and more, um, more, uh, yeah, more, more suggestions, uh, in terms of the experience of people that the experience was happening in that, to that degree, that commonly. Um, so I'm, I'm not, also, in terms of the scientific attitude, I'm not categorical about anything. You'll never hear me say, this is a fact. This is, you know, that's just not how I approach things. I'm always, let's follow where the evidence leads us. Let's see what we can discover. Let's explore and, and uh, learn more about the experience. So I, I think, unfortunately, things like that belief that, we come out of body every night. I think that's just something that comes from the old literature, probably from Muldoon and Carrington. I, I, I think Muldoon, um, Sylvan Muldoon, one of the original authors, he held that belief. And that's sort of been repeated down through uh, the writings over, over the years. And a lot of people will just repeat these things uncritically. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm, at this point, I'd say I'm neutral, but I'm sort of leaning towards that's probably not the case. And also, it's quite an old-fashioned way of looking at it to even think come in out of body, you know. I, I think actually we are dealing with more likely some kind of interconnected, expanded consciousness state. So 
to think of it purely in terms of a body that pops in and out, I, I think in a way we we've moved beyond that in terms of models of of how this experience probably works. And I can get into the different models if you want, and we can talk about um, the the different scientists and the different ideas and the research I've done in the laboratories, which I think starts to suggest uh, that something else is at play. Oh yeah, fantastic! I would actually love to get in that like right after the break actually so you guys i'm gonna i see your questions in there already and i will get to those but i gotta hear about this it is important that we take a scientific approach to this as well and not always just give into the spiritual rhetoric after all we got to find the truth about this because it is happening we're here with graham nichols we'll be right back more lighting the void coming up stay with us Art Bell, and you are listening to The Fringe FM. This is Corbin, son of the one and only Joe Root, and you're listening to The Fringe FM. Introducing Shadow Light Tarot from Waking Canvas. The Fringe FM's new contributing artist, Eric Tisi. This hand-illustrated black-and-white self-published deck serves as a reinvention of the tarot. Never before witnessed, each of the several suits of this 88-card deck lineup form an infinite panoramic scene. Even the included visual companion guidebook is entirely hand-illustrated, cover to cover, with beautiful visuals and esoteric symbols and artwork. The newly released deck comes in a custom magnetic box with its own travel pouch. The Shadow Light Tarot Premium Deck and its travel size mini deck, Wonder Light Tarot, are both available now from wakingcanvas.com. If you use the code word FRINGE, that's F-R-I-N-G-E at checkout, you'll receive an extra 10% off your entire order. To discover more, including a free reading and time lapses of all the illustrated artwork, make your way over to wakingcanvas.com today. That's wakingcanvas.com. I think by now we can get the information. I love magic, and on Lighting the Void, each and every week, you will get to hear shows about magic, mysticism, and many other subjects that stretch your mind and imagination. So when I got my mind on the magic and the magic on my mind, I listened to Lighting the Void on the Fringe FM. It's magic. May the gods look with favor upon you. You're wondering what we're going to do to you, guys. Come, walk through the mossy creek and up the hill. Never mind the flashing lights and otherworldly shadows. They stay hidden within the trees. Come, step up to the shack and begin your journey to the answers that you seek. This is Lady Anne, and you are listening to Lighting the Void on the Fringe FM. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. What's up, Joe? Hey, man, I just wanted to say your show, dude, keeps getting better and better and better. I love Lighting the Void and the Fringe FM. Okay, here we go. AncientLifeOil.com. AncientLifeOil.com. Now, this is for CBD. AncientLifeOil.com. Again, for CBD. Where do I get CBD? AncientLifeOil.com. It's pretty good stuff. Organic, non-GMO. We are the Ferrari of CBDs. AncientLifeOil.com. You know, they say when you mention a person's name three times when you first meet that you're going to remember. So I'd say to you, nice to meet you, AncientLifeOil.com. It's AncientLifeOil.com, right? Nice to know that you help people. AncientLifeOil.com. Think about this. Occasional stress, occasional anxiety, occasional inflammation, occasional stiffness, and intruders that get you down. AncientLifeOil.com. Okay, so I'm going to give you a fact for the day. So Ancient Life Oil does not help you with business deals. Hold on a second. 
If you feel better, it could help you make a better decision. Okay, I'm wrong. Just remember to go to ancientlifeoil.com. We all have that story to tell in our lives. The winds were howling. The ground shook. You could hear rushing water. And then history repeats itself. When there's no power, refrigeration fails. Doors with their shelves strip bare. ATMs can't operate. Deliveries stop. Then what? These events can last days or weeks. You need a plan. In statements made during recent interviews, FEMA Administrator Brock Long has repeatedly urged all Americans to understand three truths. FEMA is broke. The system is broken. If this is the new normal, Americans can't rely on federal cavalry when disaster strikes. Don't get caught out in the elements empty-handed. Prepare with us by going to preparewiththefriends.com and get your two-week food supply, 92 servings, eight food varieties with 25-year shelf life, normally $137, now only $75. Or get a month's supply, normally $247, now only $147 shipped in one business day. Just go to preparewiththefriends.com or call 888-440-7931. That's 888-440-7931. Get this great offer and be prepared while it lasts. All right, everyone, this is Justin from the UK. Excuse the chitty chitty. If you're into the fringe and you want to hear the brass tacks, me old China plate, Joe Roop, and his guests on Light in the Void will open your mince pies. You need to shut your north and south and use your 10 speed gears and listen to them bubble. You could hear a Barry Crocker, no Brussels, but he ain't no holy fryer. Anyway, you be the Barnaby Rudge and take a butcher's. toll free from the United States or Canada. You're listening to Lighting the Void Radio. Well, Graham Nichols is our guest tonight, and we are back again talking about the out-of-body experience, but from a much, this is a very unique point of view, Uh, one like we haven't experienced before, and uh, if you want to go to the website, it is grahamnichols.com, two L's on the end, and uh, in for liminal, also trademarked by Graham, a whole nother technology that I've never heard of. I'm glad that I'm just now learning about this. And before the break, Graham, you were talking about, um, you know, how you don't really kind of go along with what everybody else is talking about when it comes to <clears throat> the out of body experience, excuse me, where a lot of us have been told that it's the same as a dream or it's all of the same thing. Um, um, they put incredible spiritual references to it, energetic references, where you are taking a, more of a scientific approach. And I can really see that in your course online, actually. I can, if I look on your OBE online course, your practical five-week course, the way that you go about it, I'm very impressed on it. This is, um, you know, you, you bring up Rupert Sheldrake quite a bit in here. Um, tell me, you think that this is all just a, maybe possibly a part of some extended type of consciousness. Like maybe there's a, a hive mind or, or so to speak, or a, a higher brain that we're all connected to, or help me here with this. Well, I wouldn't say just, <laughs> just right. Um, that's a bad that's word, a, phrase. Yeah. That, that's a, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a huge and profound thing, but I, I think I'm just following the data. I guess, I guess my attitude is, um, with this kind of area and with spiritual things in general, people will say things and repeat things that they've heard or read in other books. And, and my attitude is, well, maybe that's true. Maybe that's not. Let's let's actually look into it, dig into it and see what see what we find. Um, you know, and, and the more you do that, I think often you find that not all of the beliefs that people put out, some of them are consistent, but others maybe not so much. And and I think that's useful even in terms of understanding techniques and ways to do these things. What's the best methodology? Well, we can just repeat what everyone said for a hundred odd years or whatever, or, you know, add in the odd new technique or something like that. Or we can think about, okay, what, what are the elements that seem to be effective and like distill them down into a, into a complete approach and make it more personalized. That's the other thing. 
I realized very early in my work, um, because I've basically been teaching this since about 1990, I realized, okay, some people um, respond really well to, say, a visual approach to a technique, whereas someone else is much more intellectual if you like so they 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 respond better to more verbal or hypnotic inductions and other people maybe work better with audio and sound and and then other people are more physical and more sort of sporty types and so they need something that's more of a physical approach so I started to develop methods and approaches that are designed for the individual and what an individual is like so my book um the second book, Navigating the Outbody Experience, that one focuses on what category of person are you? Are you are you more of a waking conscious person or are you more of a dream state? Are you more the physical person? Are you more the visual person? Are you more the, you know, uh, auditory? All the different types of people. And I, I've basically designed an approach that's ideal for each of those categories of people. So, my my understanding is I don't want to do this one size fits all. I don't want to make assumptions about the way things are. I want to find out what, what the truth is. I want to try and uncover what the truth of these experiences is and what the most effective ways to explore and learn more about it are. You know, that's that's my approach. And do you think it's different for everybody? Like, I've noticed th- things, some uh, techniques are different for everyone, but I think we all would really like to find something that is super reliable. Like, you know, something that we could say, well, hey, if I try this method, I know it'll work if I'm in the right state of mind or if I'm in the right uh, health or whatever. Like something that we can depend on. Because I got to tell you, it's been so sporadic for me. And even even other times when I've managed to uh, keep my mind awake as my body falls asleep, there would be times like I couldn't open my eyes or I could feel myself, you know, rising out of the body, but I couldn't really see. I even had one time, Graham, where I felt pressure in my head and my ear as I was rising up. Have you heard anything like that before? Sure. Yeah. That's one of the, as I was mentioning, the sort of transitional stages that people get. That's another type of transitional stage that that some people describe that there's more common ones and less common ones. That's more of the less common, but it, but it's one of the types of transitional stage that people describe. So, so um, I mean, wouldn't that I think, say that it's connected to your body and brain? Like when they say that it's not, and it's your spiritual body. Well, then why did my, why did I feel like, like a swelling feeling in my head where my ears felt full? And I mean, something was connected there that I was trying to let go of, you know? No, sure. I, I think I think it's definitely connected. And, and I think you've hit the nail on the head when you were talking about um, as long as you're in the right sort of physical state and mental state, then you want something reliable. I think actually the thing that people get wrong and the vast majority of people focus on techniques. They focus on let's find this wonder technique that's going to get me out of body. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't exist. If there is a wonder technique, it's knowing what kind of physical state, mental physical state, your physiology, what the right uh, conditions are to induce the experience and how to get to that. Um, Because then it's just a matter of tipping tipping over the edge to get the out of body experience to to happen. So you can use a very simple technique for that. And actually, if you look at most of the authors most of us are using quite a sim- simple technique to get out of body. The difference between, I think, the the people who are consistently having experiences and those who aren't is not techniques. It's not about techniques. It's about the fact that the person is getting into the right kind of physiological state. And that's where things like sensory deprivation and different practices like that can help you get to that pre-state because if you think about it, you, you can be out at work, let's say, you know, minimum sort of eight hours. Most people are focused on something completely different. They might come home, they might have some food, watch TV or something, and then they try and do some out-of-body practice after that. So their whole mental focus and their whole physical focus, if you like, is on something else. 
you know, their diet might not be very good. They might not be doing any kind of meditation or any kind of uh, physical exercise, yoga, maybe that they, they're not doing any, um, you know, deep work like sensory deprivation or anything like that. So they're, so everything in essence, the balance is completely against them. Um, so I think the approach I take is more, how can we redress that balance? Um, I, I work one to one with people as well, and I, I will work out a particular program and a way to create the right balance and the create create the right physical mental state for that person to induce the out of body experience. So that's a another thing that I think is really key, and I think is often overlooked. That most people, the focus is just do this technique for for however long it takes. Um, with no real understanding of what you're trying to achieve and where the technique should be based upon, where it should be drawn from. I, I think that's key. Yeah, very well said. Very well said. Um, the void state. Actually, I, I, don't, I don't want to touch on that just yet. There's something else that caught my attention here that, um, that I'm very curious about because in your course, you have a section in there, and that's the way I am. When I look at books, I'll look at all the, the titles and just think, right? And I'm looking, it's the same thing here. The, you have solar activity, luna phases, and sidereal time. Mm. Has that really affected your work, using those these things? I th I think the, the point to make there is the effect might not be huge, but again, another... another attitude I take with my work is let's bring in all the small benefits. Let's say that's maybe a 5%, maybe 10% factor in something like this. So my, my, my approach is if we bring in uh, uh, things that give you say a 5% increase in the chances of you having an experience, if you bring in five or six things like that, then you've made a really significant increase in the chances of you having an experience. And if you consistently use those things, then overall you've got a much higher chance of having consistent experiences as well. So that's why I focus on, I focus on every element that I, you know, that I can uncover and I can learn about. Um, and with, especially with lunar phases, I discovered that they have an impact because I went to a lecture where a man was talking about a version of astrology that focused on the moon. This was his, uh, his own sort of invention and his own idea. And I found this interesting and I went and spoke to him after the lecture and I told him about my out of body work. And he, he said to me, have you, do you have a diary of your experiences? And I said, I do. I've, I've kept a diary since, um, 1990. So oh, wow. I basic, I basically went back and, and selected key experiences, like what I would say are peak experiences, the, the ones that are very significant and that, you know, really stand out from the rest. And I, I selected maybe, I, I forget now, but maybe like 20 of them or something like that. And then I went back and I looked at all of the uh, lunar phases. I used an app on the on the computer and I just found what the lunar phase was at the time. And I discovered that there were consistencies in, in the lunar effect at the time that I was having these peak experiences. So that information then suggested to me that, okay, at least in my case – there are certain uh, factors that seem to be related to the lunar phase. Um, so then my approach is, okay, well, then let's work with other people. Let's give them that information. They can try that and see if it has an, an impact and a positive effect for them. And it seems, again, that I think there is a, there is a positive effect. In the um, sidereal time, for example, in, in remote viewing research, I got the idea uh, – from that to look into that area because remote viewing seems to work better if you if you factor in sidereal time so there's there's lots of different factors also sunspot sunspot activity and calm times in terms of sun activity 
um, also seems to be what you could say is a, a mild environmental effect on on psychic ability and on people's ability to have experiences like OBEs. So I just think let's use everything that that we can uncover and let's uh, you know um, give ourselves the best possible chance of being successful. Yeah, that is very interesting because. Uh, when I started doing work with uh, Rigardi and the Golden Dawn, they they tell you in the to, to a neophyte phase to well, there's parts that tell you to journal um, when you do these things. Uh, either if you're doing ritual or you're keeping a dream journal, what phase is the sun and the moon is in, and like where the what sign mm-hmm. the sun and the moon is in, and what phase. And um, I. I don't know. I'm just very kind of excited that that's a part of it because it tells us something about um, that. That maybe the occultists weren't wrong, and I'm and I'm not just saying okay. Graham's telling me about his case, so that means it's true. But from what you're saying to me, it means it could be true that the moon is actually connected to the our consciousness to that realm, so to speak or what they uh, refer to as the lunar body or the psychic realm or astral realm, it seems, you know. It does seem like they just knew something about it. That's all. That's all I'm saying. Well, I I think what you could say about occultism versus, say, religion or a lot of spiritual approaches is that it it does have more of that um, scientific mindset. Um, most, Most occult practitioners are creative people they're not they're not just statically sort of copying something down through time a lot a lot of them are moving things forward so they'll they'll learn from from something and then develop it improve it um so you know that's that's the kind of approach i take as well so it's you know and i i studied extensively all all of the occult practices and was a member of a golden dawn group in london i was i've also uh worked in the um argentium astrum kind of system the crowleyan system i've also was a brief member of the iot illuminates of fanateros the uh, chaos magic organization so i've i've explored that extensively and worked with various different areas within that so um I think in a way it was that kind of understanding or especially the philemic Crowleyan approach that gave me that idea of let's work in more of a science way but apply it to these spiritual areas like I mentioned to you in the break, you know, the the method of science, the aim of religion. So it's sort of, and when I say the aim of religion, I don't mean to make a religion, I mean this idea of um what is religion is trying to give us some understanding of the spiritual nature or spiritual realm. Um, So using the scientific method, which really I I look at it as the ultimate meditation. Science is not a thing. Science is a methodology. Science is a way of uncovering truth. And that's really what we're all about. So anyone who's sort of in the spiritual area who who denies science to me, they they've kind of, you know lost the plot a little bit because it's sort of the point to me is we're trying to uncover what what is the truth yeah so obviously there can be a scientific sort of consensus and and ideology and that's not really science that's just um a bunch of people who say no this is how it is and i'm i'm very fixed but that's not what i'm talking about i mean this approach where we're trying to uncover truth so in a, that's why I say it's the ultimate meditation, because in, in that sense, it's this um, trying to see reality or the nature of reality as it really is. Um, and this sort of methodology of like testing our beliefs, testing whether something is true, not just accepting it blindly. That really is the the beauty of science and what science is really about. Um, and I think many of the occult practices have a similar thing. You can, you know test i'm going to do this ritual does it work it's you know am i getting uh, is there a result in terms of results magic if we're talking about like you know that kind of level and then even on a spiritual level if you're talking more like the great work or the more sort of spiritual ideas within philema and things like that 
what is the ultimate aim what am i what am i trying to do am i moving closer to that spiritual um transformative level that i want to reach so there's 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 sort of i think an essence of that objective sort of open-mindedness i would probably say that occultism to me is the science of the objective of the subjective and standard science is the science of the objective that's kind of how i tend to look at it yeah i always looked at uh, religion as um like the right brain understanding of things and then science would be the left brain understanding of things so to so to speak uh almost like there are two sides of uh the same coin and i wouldn't say religion i would just say mythology no. symbols yeah I, I would you know things yeah, like that i i would say more this more the sort of uh the spiritual or the or the occult um side would be the sort of other side of the coin yeah more the more the exploring of the the right brain or whatever but but i think ultimately the best scenario is to ha- is to kind of have have both um because ultimately science is what's really, I think, giving us many of the most consistent and uh, amazing things in the world now. So, now you, just out of curiosity, you say you were you that you were a member of a Golden Dawn group and OTO and the IOT, which is I mean, no, for anybody... no, I wasn't. I wasn't ever a member of the OTO. It was okay. Argentium. It Argentium, was an Argentium I'm sorry. Astrum group. Yeah, Silver, um, the AA. Which is, yeah. if for anybody, I'm sorry, I apologize about that, because I usually never make that mistake, but uh, just for anybody that wants to know, that's Crowley's um, initiatic method, kind of like his Golden Dawn system, and then um, the IOT, or, so did you move on from these things, did you, are you still kind of involved, or did you say, well, I understand what this is about now, and I can move on from these things? Um, I, I would say that I, I, I moved more towards, um, I guess more of a sort of nature based sort of approach, but, uh, nature and consciousness, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, I've, I've taken a lot of the, I, I guess the, the underlying principles, the practical structure that I still practice is, uh, very philemic but I don't take on the religious or um, more theatrical, ritualistic aspects of Philema. Um, but I, and I don't, I don't sort of, I'm not particularly interested in the book of the law and things like that. But I, I think that Crowley's idea is of the great work and his idea of um, using Gematria and things like that were very interesting. And I, I think that his, understanding of magic in a very sort of scientific way um where he just he could apply it to anything it could be going to the printer and paying the printer to you know print a book for you or whatever that that's all very much in in tune with this kind of way of looking at it in a wider perspective so i guess i i relate to that um but growing up in the 90s in the uk you had the the birth of chaos magic you had um, a very rich culture. Um, Andrew Chumbly, I remember like him being around and he was someone who ha- was combining chaos magic and Philema and also this very traditional sort of witchcraft kind of idea, uh-huh. which was interesting to me. And then um, I was very inspired by Austin Osman Spare. You had uh, groups like um the temple of psychic youth and genesis p orridge and all it was it was a heady mix i would say the the occult scene of the uk during during that time the late 80s early 90s um uh and, and i i i joined this group um that was based in oxford it was a it was called a golden dawn group but i i would say that it was quite eclectic, but the main the main undercurrent again was that was more the sort of philemic area. So that's the area I've I've worked the most with, and I still see a lot of my work as being to do with like the four one eight principle, the great work, you know, uh, that kind of thing, uh, spiritual unfoldment through through practice. And and 
many many of the many of the ideas all relate to my out of body work as well. Wow, yeah, I've got to expand on this more. I really do. This is a <laughs> yeah, because I mean, I want to find out all of the ties, man. What were these? What did the occultists know? Like they knew something, and that the scientists are just now. Some scientists are just now trying to figure out. Yeah, but we do got to take a break. Um, wow, yeah. So I want to talk to you guys a little bit more about this. We'll be right back with Graham Nichols, too. Please go check out his website, GrahamNichols.com. The course that I was talking about is right there. You can go check it out. And if you see the outline of it, from the afterlife and into your life, this is Art Bell. And you are listening to Joe Roop and Lighting the Void here on the Fringe FM. This is Crow Triple Seven, and you are listening to the Fringe FM. I'm Ryan Gable, and I want to remind you to keep your radio, phone, tablet, or computer tuned to the Fringe FM. And visit the website, thefringe.fm, to listen to the entire lineup of shows. You can also catch my broadcast, The Secret Teachings, Monday through Friday, beginning at 12 a.m. midnight U.S. Pacific Time, right here on The Fringe FM. Alex X. Hi, I'm Alex Exum, and you're listening to The Fringe FM. OMG! People are jumping on board to the Life Change Tea Regiment. Brew, steep, and drink for a gentle, taste great cleanse. It's changing how they feel. See what everybody's talking about. Log on to getthetea.com. That's getthetea.com. Life Change Tea aids in digestive slowdown and helps people get moving down a healthy path. We won't make claims. We'll just let you decide. Experience is much better than a commercial anyway. If you want results, log on to getthetea.com and purchase your super strength cleansing tea. You won't be disappointed. And if you're looking for some mind-body suggestions, go to YouTube and punch in the search bar, Health Matters Now. That's Health Matters Now. Put power into your health now. So, get the tea.com. That's get the tea.com for super strength tea. And YouTube, Health Matters Now. That's Health Matters Now for valuable suggestions. Get the tea.com, the tea that makes you go. This is Reverend John M. Polk. Please visit me at johnpolkmedia.com and visit my show, Quantum Hologram Matrix, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, every Tuesday on thefringe.fm. Lighting the Void is proud to announce Mind and Magic's Protection and Defense Course for protection from magical and psychic attacks. This is not a joke. Magic practitioners are on the rise, and with that comes attacks from baneful or black magicians that try to harm or hurt others for their own selfish reasons. If you are not a believer in psychic attacks, then this isn't for you. If you are, and you want the power to defend yourself and your family and home, then I highly suggest you grab Freighter Xavier's Protection and Defense Course. In this course, you will learn how to tell if you are under attack from a natural natural source or if an individual is attacking you. The four forms of curses and attacks. How to remove self-imposed curses. The correct way to cleanse your home from negativity or malevolent entities. How to make your own holy water. What you should always keep near or under your bed. Herbs that banish negativity and promote purity. The most powerful banishing rituals on the planet. And for those that seem to want to harm you the most, how to put your enemies in a hell pit of their own making. You can also learn protection against shadow people and other entities. Or are you just in a bad planetary alignment? Even how to get rid of an enemy using a tic-tac box. It does not matter what your faith or belief is. This will work. Click the banner on the website at lightingthevoid.com or go to lightingthevoid.com forward slash Xavier. Hey, Friends FM listeners. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or no Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of the Friends FM by calling 701-719-3971. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. Saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Call 701-719-3971. That's 701-719-3971. Listen to the Fringe FM on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Hey. 
Hey, is that a new music app? Yeah, check it out. Surfer Music Discovery. It links to thousands of online stations, but the twist is you see the song names and artists that are now playing live. That's different. No guessing. Looks like a waterfall of music. So many formats. Rock, oldies, country, R&B, jazz, and a whole lot more. How's that spelled? Surfer. S-U-R-F-R. Is it expensive? It's free. No need to sign up or sign in. Get the Surfer Music app free from Google Play or the App Store. Hola, French listeners. This is Dave Cruz of Beyond the Strange, and you're listening to The Fringe FM. You're listening to Lighting the Void. The call in number is 1 800 588. 0335. If you would like to text, you can text in at 501 777 5631. Yeah, I'm, you can tell we came in late because I'm, I'm, whoa, what was that? I don't know. Mercury retrograde, maybe. Talking and talking to Graham Nichols and uh, during the break about this uh, stuff, as far as the occult groups go and all the uh, secret societies. But uh, the AA is something we haven't really talked about on the show a lot. But what I was telling Graham during the break is that I was, and some of you guys are going to smite me for saying this, but I was incredibly impressed at at the system actually because it did have everything to do with. <sighs> I guess consciousness and focus and it seemed a little bit more difficult. It seemed a little bit more intensive. And I think there's a direct um, relation to that though. Like why, why we can't have an out of body experience. People say, well, how come others can have an out of body experience? And you know, one day after the next and other folks, they just, no matter how hard they try, they can't do it. Well, I don't know if you would agree with this or not, Graham, but if you took, let's just say, the system like the AA system and just tried to go through it. And it was the first time you'd ever tried uh, any type of high magic or meditation like that. You would see that our brains are just, they just, they're going nuts all the time. You can't even sit still. And I think that tells us that there's something there. There's some type of block there that keeps us from having these experiences. What do you think? Yeah, like, like I mentioned before, I think I think that we we're dominating our conscious awareness with distractions, with you know things that are not to do with our spiritual work, and um, whatever kind of practice or system that we might apply, or or techniques or methods or whatever it might be, the more we tend to discover things about ourselves that show us that that's the case so um you know fasting for example um shows us our dependency on food um asana or postures teach us about our you know our phys- physical body and how we, how we how we react you know um Many tribal cultures use things like sweat lodges or um, pain endurance or things like this, which also teach us about how our how our mind endures things and how our minds and bodies interact and can take things. And I, I think that a lot of the time, in order to get to that next level, there's this aspect of going out of our comfort zones. It's very important to take that step where we go we go further or we go deeper into something um if we're too casual about it or if we're too in normal consciousness it's it's very hard to to get to that state that's needed for the out of body experience so there's always a if you like if you if if you, your work and um tv and you know all, all surfing facebook or whatever if all that stuff is dominating your consciousness then you're already at a deficit You've already got to kind of make up ground before you even get to kind of ground zero where you can start to build something. So I think that's really the key with any kind of trance state or transcendent experience or spiritual development. Um, That's why all of these practices and groups, they devote a lot of time 
to practice practice is the is the key you know it's not it's not intellectualizing you know it's actually doing practice and getting out there and and practice can look very unusual as well it can be it it could just be a hike it could be like walking up a mountain it could be you know it, there's so many different things that teach us about ourselves and and tell us something so i i think it's important to explore all of those and to and to get, consider what what might be the right avenue for us where do we need to stretch ourselves more where do we need to make changes in our lives and how how can we be the the best person we can be how can we fulfill our potential as human beings i think that's those questions are important when we when we're on this kind of uh track if you like right yeah and uh, like i was saying before i got into uh doing those um prana positions and i was like i got this all i gotta do is sit in a chair with my knees together and put my hands down and not move and just breathe rhythmically no problem i could probably do this i told myself i could probably do this for an, an hour man i didn't get through one minute before i was twitching scratching my nose looking to the right to the left you know, moving my body, trying to get comfortable. And I was like, and this is not easy. I mean, this is, <laughs> it felt impossible at first, but it was showing us just how to, out of control we were with it. And yeah, it's, um, makes you wonder sometimes, Graham, like if we could get really good at controlling our focus. And I mean, really good. What could we be, what are we capable of as humans? Do you think if we were capable of these things? <laughs> um that's that's a really hard question to answer really I, I i think we're we're capable of so much and um there are so many different uh states of consciousness as well and um that we can access um so i think we can perceive through to i mean it's all essentially like the cities all the all the all the powers all the different i think essentially we do start to uncover those kinds of things it's uh um maybe you've come across Dean Radin's book uh, real yeah. magic where he where he talks about the the magical abilities but he puts it in the context of his scientific research um i've i've been in the lab with dean radin i've taken part in his experiments so um i've seen the kind of level that he goes to in terms of doing proper double blind fully controlled science but then at the same time he can see the interrelationship between this sort of bigger picture and where um, human potential could ultimately go so um yeah i think i think the sky's the limit really i wouldn't want to <laughs> i wouldn't want to say uh where yeah. the, where the limits are with that kinds of that kind of thing well i think my i guess my point is is that we think we are limited in what we can and can't do and, uh, I mean, just what you're talking about is showing me that, uh, man, I wonder sometimes if we're not purposefully, and I know this sounds conspiratorial, but if we're not purposefully being kind of controlled, so to speak, because people have done some crazy things. Look, we've done experiments on this show when it comes to focus, uh, out-of-body experiences, uh, remote viewing, uh, manifestation. You could just see that it's... We're, what we're capable of and yet humans have such a from my experience have such a bad or hard time with life for the most part and i think it, it's because we're constantly being controlled by everything around us now i'm not saying there's some big evil entity out there other than greed where people just want to make money or get into power but it it's almost like we're our worst enemy when it comes to these things you know yeah yeah um it it can it can be like that and and for sure there is uh you know um i mean you don't need to get conspiratorial about it there's obvious you know manipulation um to certain to certain levels you just need to look at um for example the case with cambridge analytica you know how um in the uk Brexit was heavily manipulated into into happening, and in the U.S., the Trump election, um, he he had a you know had Cambridge Analytica heavily manipulate people through Facebook in order to get elected. So you know this is uh, this is public information now. You know this is not conspiratorial. This is just fact now. So 
there's a, there's a certain degree that these individuals of power and systems of power obviously have an impact and obviously uh, manipulate to some degree i don't think we even need to go conspiratorial although i think it's good to make a distinction between a conspiracy which is something that we can you know there's been conspiracies throughout time and there are clearly governmental and social conspiracies all the time Um, a conspiracy theory is where you um where you exaggerate or you um, put together ideas that you don't have solid evidence for. That, w- that would be the distinction I would make. Um, it's where you, you're guessing what might be going on, um, really. That's so exactly that, what that I'm would... doing. <laughs> yeah, I'm guessing all the time trying to figure out what's going on. You know, uh, There's so many people that talk about the truth of it all. Like They know the truth of the, mm. all these conspiracies. And I'm like, how can you know? Other than well, you well, know, that, that's you know that's the important point. That's the important point. It's fine, fine that we all have guesses and hunches and all the rest of it. But I think I think we often need the humility to take a step back and say, okay, well, um, it may be true, maybe it's not. You know, it's uh, I, I like I said right at the beginning with all things, especially in my work, I try to I try to take this sort of neutral perspective and say, well, maybe, maybe not, and and then investigate and see see what seems to be the case based on what we can uncover. So have you ever been asked by people like, look, Graham, if you can do this stuff, are you telling me that you can leave your body, come over to my house, tell me exactly what I'm doing, and then go back to your body? Have you had friends or family or people that you've worked with that have tried these experiments? Well, when I when I have peak experiences, um, that's the case. The The problem is, is getting the peak experience um, on on tap but um i guess my decision the decision i made with that kind of thing quite early on is i don't do it in a pointless way so i don't do it with friends and family right um but what i decided is 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 i will i will do it under controlled conditions in a scientific laboratory context so i've worked with dean radin rupert sheldrake and the ryan research center so dean radin at the institute at the um, ions institute of noetic sciences so that's kind of my approach now. Um, so the last study I did was a, a 12 week study where, um, the Rhine research center were setting up, uh, targets, images, target images. And, uh, basically I had to describe and send drawings, etc., of what I thought the target image was. And we had a different one every week. And as you probably know, the Rhine is in the US. Um, at the time, I was living in Estonia. I lived in Estonia for the last decade. I've only just returned to the UK. Um, so um, I was based there. And so I was trying to perceive what I thought um, was was on this image at the on the other side of the world, basically, um, and sending it off. And then a week later, I would get sent the image as feedback so I would know whether I was accurate or not. So we 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 did work with that and I got statistically significant positive results. So that's been the case when I worked with Rupert Sheldrake as well. Um, in his precognition test, I got the highest score he'd seen. He sent me an email saying that's the highest score I've ever got. So he was pretty happy about that. Um and also in the Dean Radin experiments, we were, that was with micro PK, so affecting things on a on a sort of quantum level, the famous double slit experiment. So I was put in a metal room that he's got there, like it's basically like a Faraday cage, and they sort of lock you in, and then you have a recording that tells you what to do, um, and you try to alter the randomness of the the quantum events through the double slit experiment um and then again that's analyzed statistically and he said it was uh, positive in the predicted direction so positive for psychic influence basically so those are the kinds of things i i work with now because i think that if we're going to do things like that we need to do it in a scientific context so that the so that it's all recorded and it's and it uh, has some use scientifically. And when someone says, oh, you know, but that's not scientific, it's not been done. It, like if, if you do something like I've had 
experiences like um, the Soho bombing experience, for example, where I perceived the bombing that happened in Soho five days before it actually happened during an out of body experience. Um, I've made a video about that if people want to watch that on YouTube. Um, but I perceived that I felt like I was standing there. It was probably the most profound, powerful experience I've ever had standing watching this sort of terrorist attack from from an out of body experience. But then a lot of the skeptics, even though there were four, uh, four witnesses there, a lot of people will still dismiss it as a story, an anecdote. Whereas if you do things in the laboratory, then they they can't do that so much. So, OK, well, we know this and is I'm the only person willing to do it as well. It seems like no one else in the OBE community is really interested in doing the laboratory science, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. Um, well, so we know this is possible. Do you mm. think this is what scares people, though? And I agree. I look, I don't like to push fear or anything like that. But everybody's talked about this. Even Robert Monroe talked about it in his book. If if we know that this is a capability, then are there people out there doing these things, um, entering our spaces or maybe even our minds, so to speak? I wouldn't put it past anything. And, you know, and if you look at, well, if you've read Dion Fortune's, I guess, uh, the, the Magical War of England or Britain, I forget the name of the title, but I do remember reading it where Mathers and Crowley were kind of going at it, that whole magical war. But these guys can do stuff in the astral realm to each other. I mean, what what could people be doing? You know, like, I think we need to learn how to do this stuff. All of us, we need to learn the truth about this so we could defend ourselves. And I'm not trying to push fear. I just, I'm all about exploring consciousness, but I'm also all about sovereignty, too, and privacy. And if we don't know that we're being invaded like this, um, that's a bad thing, if you ask me. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I, I guess I guess the thing is with with a lot of psychic research, um, it's clear that it's it's not so perfect. I mean, I, I think a lot of the way it's talked about um, in conspiracy theory writings and um, actually in a in a lot of general stuff, I think exaggerates the the level of controllability of these things. We're still we're still learning, we're still exploring. And I, I don't think that, well, I, I mean, the level of perfection someone would have to have to really be able to kind of cause harm in any particular way. It just seems unlikely that someone would develop themselves to this level and then use it in that way. Um, I'm not saying that there's no one, but I'm saying that it would be I think they would be a really tiny minority. Um, it's it's just, I mean, and even sort of the occult groups I've been involved with, you know, many over the years and the many occultists I've met, I can't really say that I've met anyone who's particularly, they might be interested in using it for selfish ends, but not in terms of like harm and things like that. I can't really say I've encountered anyone like that. So um, I think it's, it's something that obviously a lot of people worry about and are scared of, but I think that our threats and our, the things that are, you know, likely to harm us are far more tangible, to be honest. I think it's, we need, we do need to worry. Yeah. Like you say, sovereignty and privacy, you know, a lot of uh, governments invading our privacy, you know, monitoring everything we do. Um, you know, I come from a very, um, anarchistic perspective i think um, and when i say that i mean in terms of cooperation and freedom um people often misunderstand what that word means it doesn't mean chaos um anarchism is essentially a cooperative system of uh, maintaining human freedom and I, I think that that's really really important in in this in this situation that we're in at the moment um with government's all over the world yeah, man, uh, invading right and, and causing problems. So, yeah. yeah, it's extremely bad right now. I mean, there's, yeah, it's, there's so much going on that we're getting played uh, on so many levels. And I think, um, trying to understand the subconscious is my biggest thing trying to, and I don't think I explain it very well, Graham, about how 
much our subconscious influences our reality. Like where we could be surfing social media all day and looking at certain things and just taking in so many things into the mind, but we're only conscious about what we were just now looking at in the moment, but don't realize that everything that we looked at throughout the day went in there and our subconscious is figuring out what to do with it or, or programming us. And I mean, it's kind of like when you see a McDonald's logo and you hate McDonald's, like it's the grossest thing in the world, but you see enough logos and, uh, you know, 13 hours later, maybe even less than that, you're really craving McDonald's and you don't know why. I mean, this thing has happened on multiple levels that we're not aware of, not to mention the polarity that's going on. It it does seem chaotic. It doesn't seem like we have our sovereignty when it comes to awareness and consciousness at all. No. Well, I mean, obviously, that the example you just gave, you know, we, we live in a capitalist system, late capitalism, that the focus is on basically constantly profiting and making more profit and reducing liabilities and <laughs> getting more and more people to consume um, particular products. So the entire structure of society through capitalism is based on manipulation and, and coercion. So, um, yeah, it's it's obvious that that's going to have a big influence to some degree. And it is it is very hard to step outside of that and to uh, – move away from that but the great thing is this kind of work that we're talking about hopefully that will start to create shifts and to sort of open people up i mean another example is um you talk about mcdonald's i mean i, I very much through my through my practice became aware of the abuse of animals and the way that um the way that society kind of has industrialized mass killing of of living beings so that also led me to make a spiritual choice to not be a part of that and to um no longer consume products from animals and that kind of thing so um you know and support human rights and all different areas like that so it's had a complete impact on my spiritual journey and my understanding of how i interact with the world um so i i think that these kinds of practices do have that potential and they do have the potential for you to Thanks for listening to this broadcast. Need another late night fix? You can tune in every weeknight to Lighting the Void with Joe Roop on the Fringe FM. Hi, this is David Owen with House at the End of the Drive.com. You're listening to KTLK, the Fringe FM. I like to listen to Lighting the Void because of the guests, the content, and the host, Joe Roop. He's smart, he's intelligent, and he seems to ask the questions that we all have on our mind. We're all searching for the truth, and Joe helps us get closer to it. I love this show. I love this show. I love this show. Light in the Void. What's up, Joe? Hey, man, I just wanted to say your show, dude, keeps getting better and better and better. I love Lighting the Void and the Fringe FM. Hi, this is Aaron Hunter, host of Real Paranormal Activity, the podcast where we tell real paranormal experiences of people from around the world. And we also conduct interviews with authors, investigators, psychics, and mediums. Real people, real stories, real fear. Thursdays at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern on The Fringe FM. See you then. 
hey, this check is wrong. I worked a holiday and seven hours of overtime. Not getting paid correctly is a real pain. It could also hurt our boss if our company provides out of compliance checks. That's right, construction companies doing business with the government can get fined, or officials of the companies can go to jail if the checks aren't right. It's a law. The Davis Bacon Act has 30 compliance issues for every check, but there is an easy way for construction companies to be in compliance. EMARS offers Compliant Client, a web based system that finds and corrects all 30 of the possible out of compliance check issues. Users of Compliant Client report an 80% savings in time and money. Running a weekly payroll usually takes about five minutes. All 15,000 plus clients of EMARS have never had a legal compliance issue. Plus, they sleep better on check day. Contact EMARS at emarsinc.com or call 480-595-0466. The Fringe FM isn't just a radio station. We also provide services for all your audio production needs. If you are interested in live radio or pre-recorded podcasts, we're here to help. We even do audio enhancements and voiceovers if needed. If you want to do a podcast or live radio show and even want the option to syndicate on terrestrial radio from simple audio file enhancement to live production and call screening, we have you covered. We have worked with some of the best professionals in the business in order to provide coaching instruction for content creation, show structure, and more. Contact The Fringe Digital Media for more at info at thefringe.fm. That's info at thefringe.fm. Or call 501-777-5631 for a consultation. Do you want to know the truth? Are UFOs real? Are aliens visiting Earth? Are governments around the world hiding the biggest secret in history? We're UFO Seekers, official partner of The Fringe FM, and we're on a hunt for the truth. Join us as we investigate locations like Area 51 by subscribing on YouTube at youtube.com slash UFO Seekers. Hey, Fringe FM listeners. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or no Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of the Fringe FM by calling 701-719-3971. No smartphone, app, or Internet needed. Saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Call 701-719-3971. That's 701-719-3971. Listen to the Fringe FM on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Hello, this is Vance Nesbitt. Take the time to expand your mind by listening to Lighting the Void with Joe Roop right here on the Fringe FM. Alex X. Hi, I'm Alex Exum, and you're listening to the Fringe FM. system and stuff it's uh anytime windows gets pretty aggressive with those security updates it cuts right into there so yeah sometime in the near future we will be doing a uh, uh probably like dennis is talking about a gofundme for a physical encoder a real one yeah uh, anyways tonight we're here with graham nichols we're talking about uh his courses his books his experiences with out of body stuff but it hasn't been and also uh we haven't even talked about your books yet but you it's not just out of body experiences that that you've had you've also talked about what telepathy and have had experiences with other things as well not just uh the out of body experience so i don't want to just narrow it down to that uh, graham if you've had other experiences that have been prevalent in your life yeah sure i i guess um i guess i've been uh having all different kinds of experiences most of my life and um because of different practices as well you know um like we talked about with the different groups and things like that i've explored a lot of different areas it's just 
the outer body experience was the area that I guess has fascinated me the most, captivated me the most, and that I'm most skilled with. So that's been the the area that's become the focus. Um, I think my most profound experiences have come through that, um, like the precognitive one I mentioned, and also um, many many experiences that seem to verify things like life after death. I had a an experience where I was in a, a vast, misty kind of environment, very, um, very hard to define the boundaries of it, the, the up, down, you know, everything was kind of just kind of mist, really. And, and I saw maybe 100, 150 people, something like that, all standing in the distance. Um, seem, they seemed to be confused. I was watching them going through these different memories. I could even see like the memories sort of around them. It was almost like I was watching it on a screen, like seeing uh, like their life review, essentially, like they were wow. going through a through a seeing of their what had happened in their life. Um, and then I slowly drifted away from the experience and I came back to my body. And then afterwards I found that the exact time that I'd been having the experience, there was a plane crash in Norway and that about 150, well, I think 140 people had died in the plane crash. Um, and it, it was then uh, reported on the news and all that kind of thing. So um, I've had experiences like that that were sort of verified on this level, but um, the experience seemed to happen on a different level, like a um, spiritual level altogether. So um it's it's not easy to categorize that and to put that into what exactly that is and how we understand that. But I think that those kinds of experiences obviously um, challenge our conceptions about how life works and about um, the nature of things and um, opens up those big questions. So I think that's why the out-of-body experience has become sort of the focus for me. Uh, but well, I think with a... Then. <laughs> I mean, if you can, well, it was do, a very what, positive experience. Does it make you feel guilty though? Like if, if you see something bad that's going to happen and it happens, you know, it's not unlike what Robert Monroe talked about. He had, precogs oh, that, that wasn't, too, that know? wasn't, that wasn't precognitive. That, that experience, that experience happened as it happened. So, oh, okay. um, it was just that the, the accident happened and then I saw people essentially sort of passing over. Um, oh, okay. So, so it it wasn't it wasn't precognitive that one. Now, have you ever had an experience to where, as how many times do you think you went out of body? If you had to guess, like literally successful launches out of body, you're out of body in this area, or just the real out of body. I think I've worked it out one time, and it it has to be in the thousands. I oh I haven't because um, I I I, wor- I worked it out something like well, it's been I've been having them for what would it be 30 like 32 years or something now um so 32 years and then if i if i just did it say like in let's say an average of 3 per month um over that time period you know you can do the the maths it's a it's a it's a lot of experiences that is a lot man so do you do you find the the real world boring then i would I'd be like, if you could go out and have that many out of body experiences, something's got to. Are you getting bored, man, at all? No, not at all. Not at all. I actually another of my things where I'm not, I'm I'm not really like most people in that sense that I actually think that quite possibly this is the pinnacle rather than a lot of people kind of tend to dismiss the physical, but actually I think the physical is quite possibly the pinnacle of these different levels and uh, well i have no reason for example to assume that it's not um you know so again because you're alive maybe (laughs) yeah i get what you're saying well well, yeah 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 yeah. and you're conscious I, i mean i'm alive and i'm conscious and um it's my primary perception of reality is through the physical so why would i sort of dismiss it i i often think that um there's all these areas that 
a lot of culture and religion has historically been negative about and i and i question that i you know the physical body sexuality nature and i'm kind of like well actually i think these things are pretty good you know why why do we why do we have to categorize them as that that because something is more fluid if you like like this the spiritual levels or the non-physical types of experiences that we can have because they're more fluid and whatever and they give us um, information or they give us transformative experiences or something that doesn't necessarily mean that they're better we we have physical experiences that change our lives and um, are positive and transformative as well Um, you know most of us want to have love in our lives for example with a partner and that kind of thing so that's a really profound transformative thing that nearly every human being does you know we can we can try to make positive changes in our lives and towards others so there's lots of things that i think are just as spiritual and profound about physical reality so yeah i don't i don't subscribe to that we're just here um you know as a sort of training camp kind of thing um which uh is one of the things me and uh, william bjorman don't agree on we uh i i uh i think he's a great guy and we've we've met and everything um but you know there's certain things that i just think why would we subscribe to the idea that life is sort of not important and that you know uh have it, protecting the world and uh the people in it is important to me. So I I guess that's how I see it. Yeah. Well, you know what? A lot of people won't uh, disagree with some of the bigger um, names in this field. They just, they're yes men and we're not going to get anywhere like that. Um, I I, I respect William Buellman extremely well. I do, but uh, there are some things that, that I challenge that I wonder about because I'm nowhere near as leveled as he is on any of you guys on this stuff. But, um, yeah, I think you're right. I think we should challenge all of these things. Um, so can you tell me, um, now that we're here, I want to talk about this void state that you discuss. You're the only person I know that has calls a state of consciousness this uh, void state. Can you explain that a little bit more for me? Well, well, again, that, that came out of this attitude of not making assumptions. So I started to, when I started working one-to-one uh, with people, I started to ask them, okay, can you give me details of your experience? So when they had an out-of-body experience, I would get them to describe it in quite a lot of detail. Um, And I would, basically, I've put together now statistics um, through the clients I've worked with over the years. What what do they experience? What kinds of... uh, things seem to be effective for them and work for them in terms of having experiences and what are the most profound types of experiences they've had, etc. And at the beginning, I think like a lot of people, I assumed that the only transitional state really was the vibrational state. Um, But then I started to discover that people were having, for example, sound was like a common one and not necessarily buzzing, which could be a, an extension of the vibrations. People were having things like hearing conversations. Um, and it, it could, yeah. it could be very like, not, not the type of sound that we might assume. And then another common theme that started to come up was this void state. People would start to say, yeah, I went into this it was almost like a womb like experience. It was dark. I couldn't see anything. There was no visuals. Um, I wasn't really thinking about much. I was, but I was aware that I was conscious. I, I was simply just there. So it sounds very much like a sort of primal consciousness or a very simple sort of deep meditational type consciousness. Nothing, no, it, it, like if the mind was completely still and you were completely just open, um, that's the kind of state we're talking about. And people would describe to me that if I allowed myself to just stay in that state and to let that state um, wash over me, if you like, after a while, I would start to transition into 
an out of body experience and I would start to perceive landscapes or I would find myself moving over lands, physical landscapes or sometimes um, in environments that seemed on a completely different level altogether. So people would increasingly describe this state. So I started to call it the void state. Um, so that's basically the, the, in, the, it's a, it's kind of a precursor to the out of body experience. And some people describe a blue state. Um, many of my precognitive experiences and some of my, um, very accurate, what's called veridical meaning objective out of body experiences have, uh, involved this blue gray kind of quality to my vision. So my perception has been tinted with this blue gray and I have a whole sort of theory of, um, that I think might be related to how the brain works and how, um, consciousness when it's out of the body or at least non-local in nature, um, might be processing the world around us. So basically it seems that we see in our body experiences elements of the visual light spectrum. It's not like we always perceive the whole visual spectrum of color and light. Sometimes it's reduced down to duotone, i.e. like two, two colors. Um, and I started to research that as well and find that many other people were describing in their out body experiences that they would see in two colors um, and things like that. So I started to put together a model, which I call the mass model, as in um, it stands for mobile autonomous sensing self. So this idea of a, um, a sensing self separated from the physical. And I, I've started to categorize these different things. I've also got, um, instead of using out of body experience, I tend to use um ICE independent consciousness experience because I think that what most people are describing is more more of an independent consciousness rather than um, an out of body experience often a body has nothing to do with it people don't even think about their physical body or an energy body neither of them come up for a lot of people so um, and and what happens is often in research for example in the 1980s and, uh, and earlier, there was research done by Carlos Osis, who was a Latvian parapsychologist, and he worked with Alex Tanis, um, who was someone who, like me, would sort of induce out-of-body experiences. And he he worked with Tanis, and they, they managed to um, find that when he didn't have a sense of a body, when he didn't have this sense of leaving the body and all the classic out of body elements, when he just felt that he was a consciousness, he was able to perceive things accurately in the laboratory. So this goes back to trying to find evidence and to prove the existence of these experiences. So um, that way they managed to um, gain some evidence um, for it. So that also suggested to me that maybe we are dealing with more of a kind of network of consciousness rather than a literal energy body that comes out of the physical like a kind of Russian doll. Um, so that's how I've been sort of following the the data and uh, exploring more of what might be actually going on with these experiences. Yeah, that's interesting. So the the void state is something, you know, we had – the Reverend Dan Lopez on here, who's, uh, you know, he's been diagnosed with a, a heart condition, and but he had had a few experiences in his past, um, where he had a rough past, you know, like a lot of people have, and uh, he kind of blacked out, and he said he was in this place where it was just darkness and blackness, and uh, you know, he talked about it as if he almost died. He's talked about it on the show a few times, uh, and said that he heard a, a screaming, like a like, you know how you can hear somebody screaming far away? And he mm. said it was really wild how he talked about it. So he heard the the voice just like this, you know, the ah, that kind of screaming. And as it got closer and closer, it became louder and more auditory until it got right up to his head. And then it was him, and he woke up saying that he's like, ah, I got to pee, right? Like he went to this crazy 
place that it sounds like you're describing it. And I wonder um, sometimes if when people pass away or if they get on that, that edge of passing away, if they go there, because, you know, uh, could be where religion talks about purgatory. That could be a metaphor or something like this type of state of consciousness where you're kind of stuck in this place of nothingness, you know, like the void. Um, I I would I wouldn't say that with the void. The void state is a very positive, very non-negative in any way kind of state. It's more it's more like a a womb-like state. But well, I he did say that though. I forgot to mention. Um, oh, okay. That it was wasn't because I did ask him that, and everybody remembers this too. Were you scared? Did it feel bad? And he said no. Uh, it felt. I didn't feel anything. It was peace, I guess, if you want to call it like a nothingness, but not really a care in the world is what he said, you know? Mm. So I don't know. That's interesting though. Um, but then other people talk about lower levels where they've seen things like parasites and lower entities and stuff. Do you, do you look at this as like levels, uh, maybe like layers of an onion? Is it really like that where there's different levels of, experiences or consciousness as you're out of body or is it just pretty much one thing i i think it depends what you mean by levels again because i don't want to just go with the sort of esoteric literature and sort of assume that's how it is sure. um i'm trying i'm trying to sort of map out the time types of uh areas or levels or whatever you want to call them um i guess I guess what I would say is I don't see it. I don't see it to be hierarchical. I don't see it to be like finer and finer levels or anything like that. It mm. just seems to be that there are different, if anything, rather than finer levels, as as is generally talked about in terms of esoteric literature, it would often refer to, you know, finer and finer bodies. For example, they often talk about the multiple bodies, and for example, in the Theosophical model, which pretty much dominates most of the OBE literature, although many people don't realize that it's theosophy they're, they're reading. Um, it, will, it will talk about sort of the astral body. Well, it will talk about the physical body, the etheric body, the astral body. Then you've got like mental, causal, all these different various bodies, none of which have really any evidence for them. Um, so I don't really take them that seriously. But um, the... The, the thing that's interesting about all of that is that they've sort of divided it up, that it becomes finer and finer and finer. And I think the, the final level is the buddhic body or something like that, or the buddhic level, because um, they sort of blended in this Eastern thinking as well. Um, but the thing is, what's what I what I've uncovered in terms of looking at actual experiences and what people are experiencing um, myself and others, I mean, um, is more that there are there are sort of it would almost be like depth of experience or or um, level of quality of reality, if you like, like the experience I mentioned on the other level where I was uh, seeing the people who sort of passed over the 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 fact of what with it was it was like a peak experience the vividness of it was very very intense and the emotional impact was very very intense so all of that kind of aspect of it was was hyper um focused and i th i think it's things like that that people often describe it's more like oh this experience was so profound like is often the case with near-death experiences people will say oh you know it was so transformative and i saw this area of like light and, and energy and and things like that so um when you break it down there seems to be these areas that are defined more by the 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 reality of them the the depth of quality of them if you like rather than that it's sort of just like a, a sort of hierarchy because also the precognitive experience with the Soho bombing where I would, felt I was standing there, that also had that depth of quality, but you wouldn't necessarily, if you were taking the theosophical model, then you would have to say that was an etheric experience, but, you know, pro or something along those lines, but they don't really have a an option for precognitive type experiences so this is where you run into trouble because things start to not fit with with these 
kinds of ideas and models. And so I think often it's better to just start from the experience. If we start from the experience, we get a truthful, more more like a real kind of idea of what might be going on. So I tend to see it less in terms of levels and more in terms of depth of experience. Um, that would probably be the, the the short answer. Yeah, I guess I'm so used to the occult literature. Like Lon Maladuquette wrote that book though about the astral light where he talked about lower levels and then higher levels and even Robert Monroe said he got bored of what we call locale one, which is like the real world, but in the astral realm and then moved on to greater, I guess, and bigger realms. Um, when I say greater and bigger, I, I think it's more less like this world. That's all I can say. Um, have you moved on to places like that as well in your travels or has it always been just this kind of area, this level so to speak. Well, I, I already mentioned word. being on a on another level, the uh, you know the afterlife kind of experience. Um, so yeah, I ha- I have been to other levels, but you know, and and hundreds of experiences have been on other levels. And in my early experiences, yeah. when I was more influenced by esoteric literature, probably the majority, like hundreds and hundreds of them, were focused on those kinds of levels. But I started to find that. I considered a lot of them more illusory, um, that Hmm. a lot of those kinds of levels were not objectively real. And I sort of question that with a lot of other people's experiences now, um, because what I try to do now is to focus on, can I find some objective reality to the experience, whatever level it was on? Um, And there are many ways to do that. For example, if you meet someone else on a on another level get some information from them and then see if you can verify it like the example with the plane crash i i emphasize that experience because the depth of it the it was a peak experience it had that depth of reality and also the information that came through it that that these people had all died quickly in a in a major event and then i found that there was a plane crash that happened at the same moment um, that obviously to me verified that that's what I was experiencing when I, when I had that OBE. Um, so I, I try to sort of apply that kind of thinking to the, to the experiences. Um, but I think even in a lot of the esoteric literature, they talk about the astral plane being an illusory realm. It's not, it's not unique to my perspective to think that, um, that, that concept seems to have been lost a little bit um, in terms of more modern writings about the astral planes and things like that. But um, I tend to go with the maybe the the older concept that it is more of an illusory aspect. And I tend to find that people tend to talk about more of the lower levels and a lot of these kinds of things when they're having their OBEs more through lucid dreaming. And I do question whether a lot of the experiences that are called out of body experiences might actually just be lucid dreams. Um, so I'm, I I have a certain degree of skepticality, um, or skepticism more correctly, skepticism about the whole idea of OBEs through lucid dreams because I have all my experiences pretty much through a conscious waking trance state. Um, And the more I look into the dreaming states, they can be a good access route, but the problem is you tend to take a lot of the subjectivity of the dream state into the experience with you. Um, So then lots of things which I think are probably not real will come into the experience so there's a danger with that yeah fair enough i mean yeah you do got a very logical way of looking at things but it it does kind of make uh man it almost brings me back to zero because i'm so convinced that all of this stuff was the same thing and now after speaking to you i'm not so sure so round and round we go until we figure out the truth about this right and this is going to come from you doing your own experience GrahamNichols.com is the website. We'll be right back for Lighting the Void coming up.
Joseph Roop is your host. Pull back the blinds and uncover the truth. This is Lighting the Void Radio. You're listening to The Fringe FM. I'm Clyde Lewis. You are listening to The Fringe FM. Somewhere between abnormal and paranormal, there's a show called Into the Paranormal. I'm Jeremy Scott. Hear me live Saturdays at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 Eastern on The Fringe FM. Hey, I'm J.M. DeBoard, and when I want to talk about dreams, I look up my man Joe Root and his show, Lighting the Void. The Fringe FM isn't just a radio station. We also provide services for all your audio production needs. If you are interested in live radio or pre-recorded podcasts, we're here to help. We even do audio enhancements and voiceovers if needed. If you want to do a podcast or a live radio show and even want the option to syndicate on terrestrial radio from simple audio file enhancement to live production and call screening, we have you covered. We have worked with some of the best professionals in the business in order to provide coaching instruction for content creation, show structure, and more. Contact The Fringe Digital Media for more at info at thefringe.fm. That's info at thefringe.fm. Or call 501-777-5631 for a consultation. Listen, I want to tell you about G.I. Joy from GetTheTea.com. It's the best alchemical concoction of goodies for your stomach and digestive system I can recommend, and that's all based on my experience. Packed with colostrum, acidophilus, aloe, peppermint, and turmeric. If you do your own research, then you know this is the bee's knees for the stomach and digestion. Now, due to Big Brother's ears and the eye in the sky, you know I can't go into the details about what it helped me with. All I can say is, I got relief. It's non-GMO, no fillers, no preservatives, manufactured right here in the U.S. of A., and delivered to you by the only people who stay on top of the game and are out in front. Go grab a bottle of G.I. Joy at GetTheTea.com and see what all the fuss is about. Again, that's GetTheTea.com. OMG! People are jumping on board to the Life Change Tea Regiment. Brew, steep, and drink for a gentle, taste great cleanse. It's changing how they feel. See what everybody's talking about. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Life Change Tea aids in digestive slowdown and helps people get moving down a healthy path. We won't make claims. We'll just let you decide. Experience is much better than a commercial anyway. If you want results, log on to GetTheTea.com and purchase your super strength cleansing tea. You won't be disappointed. And if you're looking for some mind-body suggestions, go to YouTube and punch in the search bar, Health Matters Now. That's Health Matters Now. Put power into your health now. So, get the tea.com. That's get the tea.com for super strength tea. And YouTube, Health Matters Now. That's Health Matters Now for valuable suggestions. Get the tea.com, the tea that makes you go. Hi, this is Sammy. Join us in the Deep South as we're lighting the void with Joe Roop on the Fringe FM. Right, me old chiners. I know it's an ad break, but before you lot shoot off and make yourself a cup of Rosie Lee or whatever else it is you're going to sling down your Gregory Peck, you need to listen to me bubble. If, like me, you found your way to light in the void via a downloadable podcast, you might want to take a butcher's at the Fringe FM Wind and Kite. You won't Adam and Eve how many other shows there are or what they rabbit on about. Ancient history, conspiracy, the consciousness, the esoteric, the occult, metaphysics, parapolitical, ufology, technology and spirituality to name but a few. They got featured hosts like Ryan Gable, Jeremy Scott, Alex Exum, Tim Doyle, Cortana and Gigi, Susanna Ross, the Reverend John Polk, Michael Deacon and J.D. Lewis. You might find yourself listening to the thoughts and theories of the author of The Fish You Just Finished Reading. Or you could pick up the dog and bone, call in and tell everyone your own beliefs or experiences. So do me a favour. Before you put on the ansel or crack open a bottle of vino or roller joint, Go to the Fringe FM and see what you're missing. Hola, Fringe listeners. This is Dave Cruz of Beyond the Strange, and you're listening to the Fringe FM. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from Talk Stream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. 
Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Call-in number is 1-800-588-0335. All right, so before the break, I was telling Graham Nichols, our guest tonight, that I was uh, perplexed about this out-of-body experience and a lucid dreaming thing. And this is why, because um, I'll just be honest with you. We've had a lot of guests come on the show, and I mean lots of guests come on the show, Graham, and say, well, lucid dreaming and the out of body experience dreaming all of this stuff it's all the same thing but different levels of consciousness i've even looked at graphs on people's websites and i think it was jeff van etten maybe i forget who it was that had a graph of you know the out of body experience lucid dreaming the astral realm the higher realms like they could graph this stuff out and everything and i thought it was pretty cool to look at <laughs> but i gotta be honest with you man when i talk about the out of body experience especially the one i told you before um, when I talk about that thing and I get the response like, yeah, man, I've studied lucid dreaming and this and that too. It's almost like when you talk to somebody and they're not even listening to you and they, they acknowledging that they, they're not acknowledging what you believe without saying it, that it's a separate thing. And when I say separate, I don't mean totally separate, but it is a different thing. Right. And now I'm perplexed because all of these people had me convinced for the longest time up until tonight that it was, and I can say the best analogy that I'll give you this one and see what you say about it was Gordon White when I talked to him about the out-of-body experience, lucid dreaming and dreams, and he was really big into journeying and Carl Jung and that kind of work, and he said, imagine it as if it's a fader. You slide the fader up, and uh, you're dreaming, and you slide it up more, and you're out of body, and he's just giving examples, but the levels don't have to be in order. Uh, and so on until you slide the fader all the way up and you're in total awareness. That's what he was. That was the best thing I ever heard about that. But he goes, they feel separate, but they're just different levels of the same fader, so to speak. What would you say to that? Well, I do think that they're different aspects of consciousness or different types of consciousness. I mean, that's, that's obvious because, you know, we're, we're literally, obviously, a dream is a different type of consciousness. Even being completely unconscious in sleep is a form of, like, conscious. We're just, that would be the lowest level because we're unconscious. But then, you know, it comes up from there. So, yes, they are different forms of consciousness. But there are distinct and very important um, distinctions between them. Um as we can as we can identify the difference between being consciously awake and in in dream sleep for example our brain waves look different that's one one way to define the difference um the actual experience for us as individuals is different we nearly all of us can you know think about a dream and we can say oh that you know that's very different to when i'm consciously awake so um and i think an out-of-body experience has various distinctions about the way it works and the way it unfolds as well. So if we look if we look at those elements that make up these different kinds of experiences, we can create a kind of map of what an out-of-body experience is and what a lucid dream is. And if we do that, you know, and, and also what an ordinary conscious waking state experience is, we start to see that there are distinctions. There's even distinctions for example, between a near-death experience and an out-of-body experience. They're obviously related experiences, but they're, they're distinctly different. Um, in Not in all contexts, but most of the time, a near-death experience follows a different kind of structure to an out-of-body experience or a standard out-of-body experience. So I think that it's fair enough to kind of talk about these interrelationships because obviously everything in conscious experience has some interrelation, but it's also important to analyze and 
go into the details of what the different experiences are and again this this assumption that lucid dreaming and obes are somehow uh, the same thing or very closely related i think i don't i don't think the evidence is strong for that i i really don't i think that when we look closely at a lucid dream state it doesn't often entail the out of body element it doesn't have often the the depth of reality of the out of body experience um the brain wave states that people get into are different there's been research done on that um the uh, types of veridical perception that happen in OBEs are also not present in lucid dreams. Um, there's, I mean, you know, I, I've written an article. I think it has 17 points on my website that goes into all the all the distinctions. But I think uh, the the fact that the majority of people in in a lot of the studies have out of body experiences from a conscious waking state shows that it's different and distinct even there. Um, the other thing that's important to highlight with out of body experiences is they happen in a complete range of types of situations, which is not the case with dreaming. So people will, for example, have an out of body experience even while driving a car. There'll be people who oh have a cardiac, they have a cardiac arrest and they have an out of body experience. So that would be the near death context. Then there's people who have an out of body experience while meditating or have an out of body experience while walking around the house or have an I, I mean or while doing trance work like dancing like shamanic dancing or something like that so basically the out of body experience happens in a complete range of types of situations whereas dreaming only really happens in a sleep context so I mean, obviously, there are small variations on that. Yeah, people can maybe have some dreamy type hallucination or something while they're walking around. But again, we would often make a distinction there, too, that a hallucination and a lucid dream are not the same thing. You know, so it's it's it gets very tricky um, as as anything where you're defining something that's quite abstract. And there's such a broad range of experiences that people encounter. But I think on on the whole, if we categorize the the major features of a lucid dream and the major features of an out of body experience, I think they're distinct things. I'm such a nerd when it comes to this, man. Like most people want me to talk about UFOs and Bigfoot and stuff. Or, or, or hauntings, right? But I'm telling you, like all of all of that stuff that scares us is is related to this. This is, I believe, this is where a lot of it comes from. Um, and I'm on that article, by the way, that you you referenced earlier, and it's fascinating because we already talked about one, uh, and where you said OBEs virtually never occur during sleep, although people say they do. Um, you're really awake when it happens. I mean, your mind never. No, I, goes to I, I sleep, mean right? I. It, yeah, in my case, they they never ha- happen Not mine either, during sleep. Honestly. Um, and I, I I I know that people have experiences. I'm just not always convinced that the experiences they're having via a lucid dream or a dream state is actually an out of body experience. Uh, a lot of people describe out of body type experiences from sleep paralysis, but. For example, I'm not totally convinced that those are true out-of-body experiences either. They are, if you like, an out-of-body experience, but they're not the ICE experience, the independent consciousness experience that I mentioned. So that's one of the reasons I've created that new category of ICE, because I see that as a as a way of defining an experience that has a conscious objectivity to it and that com- that the elements that you perceive are consistent with consensus reality so that's the distinctive defining factors of an ICE experience over an OBE experience an OBE can basically be illusory it can be you know like what can happen with sleep paralysis it can yeah. be more of a dreamy kind of uh hallucinatory thing but you can hallucinate anything so that doesn't you know discount that there are a real form of the experience too do you um would you mind i'm gonna leave this link in the chat rooms as well as on the show but this is we've been talking about this for two years i I wish i would have found this article 
two years ago. <laughs> um, do you do you mind if I just name off a few of these and ask you a couple of questions? Is that okay? No, sure. Go for it. Go uh, for it. Okay. So number two you have here is no rapid eye movement. Uh, state is present while OB is taking place. Uh, while REM mm-hmm. is not always present when lucid dreams occur, it never is present in tests during my OBs. And now how many tests yeah. have you, have you done enough to be consistent on this, right? Like hundreds, thousands, how many are we talking about here? Um, in, in my, in my case, I, um, not, not hundreds or thousands, maybe, maybe about 20, something like that. But okay. I'm not just, I'm not just referring to my own, my own, uh, situation there. There, there has actually been laboratory work done on that. Um, I think it was Charles Tart. Um, I'm not certain about Dr. that. Dr. So. Scott Ro- Rago, Rojo, you have D. Well? Scott Rogo yeah. also did research on that. Yeah. So, D. so Scott, there, there's yeah. been a, a lot of these, a lot of these uh, questions, you know, have actually been looked at in the laboratory. So this is again why it's useful to go to the science because, well, if it is, if it is a dream, why does it not have the features of a dream? You know, this, this yeah. is so. If again. You know, if if we're we're speaking in very abstract terms, yes, they're all states of consciousness, but that doesn't really help us very much. Whereas when we really try to sort of get more um, to the details of it and, and understand the experience in how it unfolds, that can actually be very very helpful to understanding the experience and to making it easier to have the experience. Okay, uh, I understand that. Thank you for explaining that. Um... Yeah, it does matter. How, it really does. In this case, we need to really work on how we define things to get a better understanding for sure, since we're in a an area that's so unknown. Um, okay, Sent, number three, sensory awareness is heightened, more vivid or structured differently, colors, etc., to dreams and often to waking reality. Although uh, you say you've experienced extremely vivid lucid dreams, they do not compare in depth and quality to your powerful OBEs. And I can tell you just with the few I've had, that's exactly true. There is no mm. uh, clarity like that out of body experience when it comes to vision and what I can see, you know, or how reality looks, so to speak. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, number four, perceptions are often highly uh, veridical. Did I say that right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Or consistent with consensus reality, unlike lucid dreams. So, are you saying that it looks more like what we're looking at right now, so to speak? I'm I'm, sa- I'm saying that you can actually see things while out of the body, um, especially in the peak experiences that can then be later verified. And, you know, that's that's uh, that's a characteristic that is not always present in out of body experiences. And it tends to be only more in the sort of peak experiences, but it's not something that's reported in lucid dreams or you know very very rarely and and also not in a not in the same kind of context so i I think that's a distinctive factor as well i feel sick right now because i wish i would have found this article i swear like even all the times i've agreed with everybody i'm deep down i've always kind of known what you're saying here uh okay uh number five other than floating passing through objects and time being non-linear to some degree the laws of nature remain constant in some form, unlike in many dreams. Um, yeah, other than the fact that you can fly, right? <laughs> That's the only yeah. one. The gravity doesn't work very well. But if I told you, Graham, though, that when I flew, and I guess I don't even know if I would call it flying, but when I walked outside, I was reading this dream yoga book, and it would tell me, even in reality, try to fly, so you'll do that. And I, it was just a natural thing. So I looked at this point, like a fixed point, kind of like the Golden Dawn talks about, on a tree in my yard. And it was like I pulled myself to it on a zip line. It was so, uh, the velocity of it was so pinpoint. It felt like I was just on a line to it, being pulled towards it. Does that sound mm. familiar to you or did you feel something different? Yeah, I mean, that's that's actually something we could highlight as a difference as well actually um because in in an out of body experience where you put your focus um you you go there you just you know you move there either very fast or you sort of um almost like teleport there it's like a 
um, that's a feature of an out of body experience, which doesn't, you know, I, I guess it could happen in a lucid dream, but it generally isn't something people describe um, in a lucid dream. So, you know, the, these are features that are almost universal in out of body experiences, you know, where you put your attention or your focus, you go there. That's something that I think pretty much every OBE author there is would agree on. Um, I don't think that's something you would find talked about consistently in lucid dream literature, for example. So, you know, that's, again, something we could highlight as a distinction. Yeah, not not unless they wanted to, you know, well, they wanted to do that. Then, of course, you're lucid. You can do anything you want. Here's one that really yeah, yeah. Um, that sticks out, man, that's so true. Number six, recall is often stronger than a general memory after the out-of-body experience. Consistent with near-death experience accounts, unlike dreams in which recall fades or it's often hard. I put fades in there. He put it's often hard. According to my friend and lucid dream expert Robert Wagner, we had him on the show too. Love that guy. The beginning of his lucid dreams becomes more and more difficult to remember the longer the dream continues. But the length of the experience makes no difference in OBE accounts. That is yeah. true for me too. I remember every detail about it to this day. That one I had, yeah. you know. Um, number seven, there are no, uh, psychological elements to do with my day-to-day -day life, uh, present in my OBs, unlike my dreams. Hmm. Could you explain that one a little bit more? I, I mean, you know, in, in my dreams, if I, I don't know, if I was thinking about a particular issue or, you know, I knew I was going to, um, be doing something the next day or something like that, it might feature in the dream. It might come into the dream. Um, whereas in my out of body experiences, it's much more like you're dealing with a genuine reality because it's not, it's not influenced by my psychology in that way. It's, it's a, I will discover things and they will surprise me. They will be, you know, oh, I didn't, you know, I didn't imagine I would see that or. I got what you're saying. You know, and, yeah. And sometimes I'll see something and then I'll go and check if it's there um, afterwards. And it and it sometimes it is, is, you know, as as I've seen it in the out body experience. So, um, you know, that's. That, I, I don't true. remember that ever. I don't remember that ever happening with an out of body, uh, with a lucid dream. That's a hundred percent true. Like, uh, when I had that one, there's, there's no young symbols or entities or anything weird that I'm supposed to interpret. It just looked like this reality, everything, you know, I'm sure there were some minor differences and stuff, but, um, okay. Number eight, the energy or wave sensation experienced before an out of body appear to be different to those experienced during sleep paralysis and other sleep phenomena. Although more precise research is needed to be sure of this. Yeah, I'm not sure about that yeah. one either. Um, oh, number nine, a feeling of release being revitalized or very calm and positive after the OBE is common. I rarely notice anything like this after a lucid dream. The sensation can go on for hours or even days. Try months, man. Like I felt <laughs> different for two months after that. It was like the first time you've done a psychedelic, like a hardcore psychedelic, how it changes your life. That's how I felt after it. If that makes any sense to you, um, I, I've never taken any psychedelics, or I don't, I don't even drink alcohol or well, smoke or anything. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, I, I assume I can guess what you mean. Yeah, yeah, it's the first time I did LSD when I was younger. It changed, it changed everything for me. So yeah, that's totally true, man. I wish. Okay, anyways, number ten. Um, a total sense of knowing the experience was real beyond any dream I've ever had. Actually, sometimes even beyond this reality, dude. Yes, absolutely. Um, and you've had thousands of these, man. I can't imagine what it's like talking to a, a, a redneck like me from Arkansas. You know, are, are you, am I boring <laughs> you right now? No, not at all. I think um, I think actually it's really good that we're sort of digging into this stuff because very few people do. So um, it's it's good to be doing that. Number eleven: interactions with characters and stories within the experience are rare in my out of body experiences, and I'm saying my from because you this is your point of view. This can vary in accounts, but this is certainly less apparent in OBEs, and the characters, if present in an OBE will be of a different quality and type, usually guides consistent with NDEs. Think of Robert Monroe, etc. I, I never got to meet anybody. I only had a few, but 
I can't wait to see what that's about. Can you tell me about will the time it, will you it, met again, something? Again, again, it's rarer in OBEs. Um, so th- I think that's a distinctive factor again. Um, but yeah, sometimes there will be beings or but but they they tend to um when i say quality it's sort of almost like they feel very very independent and very you know very different to anything that you could come up with in terms of your own mind but obviously that's something that's very subjective and difficult to to emphasize in terms of other people understanding what i mean but um but yeah they they seem to be a very different order of consciousness if you like yeah um now i want you guys to keep in mind because i'm watching the chat room here we're we're not playing a game of football where it's obes versus lucid dreams i'm just trying to like validate you know the fact that they could be two separate things and that when i had an obe and i've had plenty of i've had a lot more lucid dreams and i've had that one experience i'm telling you Anyways, I'm gonna move on from I'm that. Not, I'm, not in the, I'm not in the chat room, but I can imagine the the kickback, which I find interesting in itself. That people find it so controversial to well, suggest. That you spoke different to Robert things. Wagner, right? Who's who's a more advanced lucid dreamer than that guy? What was his view yeah, exactly. on this? He thinks they're completely distinct things, the same as I do. I, I've I've met Robert Wagner. We've uh, we've been at a conference couple of conferences together and yeah i i i I pretty much think that nearly all nearly all the major authors in lucid dreaming charlie morley as well um another great lucid dreamer and friend of mine also thinks they're quite distinct and in his book he quoted me on one of my experiences where i was uh where the experience started from walking around my house and Mm -hmm. i went into the out of body experience from that state and his sort of argument was you know these kinds of experiences how can you categorize that as a as a dreaming state when someone is literally walking around you know doing things when when the experience is is taking place when it happens yeah um okay. so so craven in the chat room is saying uh he does remember some of his lucid dreams like very vividly um which I think that's kind of common, but I still feel like the memory. I think what's in, what's important to emphasize in the actual, if you look at the actual article rather than what we're just sort of quoting here, if you look at the actual article at the beginning, I say there are some instances. I'm not saying these things are categorical. Um, you have to look at the article as a whole. You have to take all of the the elements. You can anyone can pick out. A particular point and say oh but in my experience like some i had that or yeah. in my experience i had this but what i'm saying is if you look at the the whole of the article the the whole body of it and i don't think the vividness is like a key point i think things like one of- the fact that obes happen in a range of different states that the brain waves when they've been monitored in obes and monitored in lucid dreams are totally different i mean that in itself is sort of game over really in my mind um the fact that we've literally looked at it in terms of eeg and things like that and actually even fmri scans have been done on on a girl in canada who had out-of-body experiences and and the scientists doing those scans concluded it was not a lucid dream or it was not any kind of dreaming um so this is you know solid science that's been done on these things and i think that's in itself it's pretty categorical why they're different but you know i'm just suggesting other factors that also play into this as well beyond the science sure yeah uh totally and see i'll this is the kind of stuff i like to um talking about this is very important stuff man because so validating to me now uh we're gonna take our last break but before we do i do want to look at this one here and really like this is the big one y'all this is the one that I think really puts all of the paranormal into a bigger category than most of us realize, okay? And that is this one where it says the physical body. This is number 13. And I did drop the article in the chat, y'all. I also put it on my Facebook page as well. But the physical body is often visible 
and OBEs, and is seen as if from the perspective of a living ghost. This has never happened to me in a lucid dream, and it is not commonly reported by others, as opposed to OBEs, and which it is commonly reported. Now, before you answer that, Graham, I want to talk about that when we come back, because we're going to take this last break. But, yeah, that's the big one for me, too. I want to discuss that more when we come back with Graham Nichols. GrahamNichols.com is the website. Y'all go check it out. Stay with us. Listen, I want to tell you about G.I. Joy from GetTheTea.com. It's the best alchemical concoction of goodies for your stomach and digestive system I can recommend, and that's all based on my experience. Packed with colostrum, acidophilus, aloe, peppermint, and turmeric. If you do your own research, then you know this is the bee's knees for the stomach and digestion. Now, due to Big Brother's ears and the eye in the sky, you know I can't go into the details about what it helped me with. All I can say is, I got relief. It's non-GMO, no fillers, no preservatives, manufactured right here in the U.S. of A., and delivered to you by the only people who stay on top of the game and are out in front. Go grab a bottle of G.I. Joy at GetTheTea.com and see what all the fuss is about. Again, that's GetTheTea.com. Do you want to know the truth? Are UFOs real? Are aliens visiting Earth? Are governments around the world hiding the biggest secret in history? We're UFO Seekers, official partner of The Fringe FM, and we're on a hunt for the truth. Join us as we investigate locations like Area 51 by subscribing on YouTube at youtube.com slash UFO Seekers. Introducing Shadow Light Tarot from Waking Canvas. The Fringe FM's new contributing artist, Eric Tisi. This hand-illustrated black-and-white self-published deck serves as a reinvention of the tarot never before witnessed. Each of the several suits of this 88-card deck lineup form an infinite panoramic scene. Even the included visual companion guidebook is entirely hand-illustrated, cover to cover with beautiful visuals and esoteric symbols and artwork. The newly released deck comes in a custom magnetic box with its own travel pouch. The Shadow Light Tarot Premium Deck and its travel-sized mini deck, Wonder Light Tarot, are both available now from wakingcanvas.com. If you use the code word FRINGE, that's F-R-I-N-G-E at checkout, you'll receive an extra 10% off your entire order. To discover more, including a free reading and time lapses of all the illustrated artwork, make your way over to wakingcanvas.com today. That's wakingcanvas.com. Hey, is that a new music app? Yeah, check it out. Surfer Music Discovery. It links to thousands of online stations, but the twist is you see the song names and artists that are now playing live. That's different. No guessing. Looks like a waterfall of music. So many formats. Rock, oldies, country, R&B, jazz, and a whole lot more. How's that spelled? Surfer. S-U-R-F-R. Is it expensive? It's free. No need to sign up or sign in. Get the Surfer Music app free from Google Play or the App Store. Okay, here we go. AncientLifeOil.com. AncientLifeOil.com. Now, this is for CBD. AncientLifeOil.com. Again, for CBD. Where do I get CBD? AncientLifeOil.com. It's pretty good stuff. Organic, non GMO. We are the Ferrari of CBDs. AncientLifeOil.com. You know, they say when you mention a person's name three times when you first meet that you're going to remember. So I'd say to you, nice to meet you, AncientLifeOil.com. It's ancientlifeoil.com, right? Nice to know that you help people. Ancientlifeoil.com. Think about this. Occasional stress, occasional anxiety, occasional inflammation, occasional stiffness, and intruders that get you down. Ancientlifeoil.com. Okay, so I'm going to give you a fact for the day. So Ancient Life Oil does not help you with business deals. Hold on a second. If you feel better, it could help you make a better decision. Okay, I'm wrong. Just remember to go to ancientlifeoil.com. The night is young, so turn up the heat with your host, Joe Root, on Lighting the Void on The Fringe FM. Magic, the occult, history, health, news. 
These are just a few subjects discussed on my radio broadcast, The Secret Teachings. I offer unique and objective perspectives on new and old subjects alike, while welcoming guests and presenting my own research with no filter. Visit my website for more information and to subscribe to my archive at www.thesecretteachings.info and find me on The Fringe FM live Monday through Friday, midnight Pacific, 3 a.m. Eastern on The Fringe FM. The truth is out there. There's something out here. And so are we. KTOK Digital Broadcasting, The Fringe FM. You know, when I do radio, like I like to start with a little oomph in the beginning. And it I find it a lot of times in my case, Graham, that we get to the really cool stuff in the super late night uh, at, and the, uh, the last of the show. Okay, so before the, before the break, we're limited on time, so I want to hurry this up. I said that uh, this was the big one, right? The apparitions out of body form are reported. Uh, I knew this was going to cause call-ins, too. Um, oh, <laughs> let's see. Hold on just a second. And we'll take your call. Just one second. But the physical body is often visible in OBEs and is seen as if from the perspective of a living ghost. This has never happened to me in a lucid dream and is not commonly reported by others, as opposed to OBEs in which it's commonly reported. Uh, Robert Monroe talked about that as well, how children and others alike, and we've had reports of that too, could see people out of the body. We call them ghosts. And you have had your own experience with that. Can you tell me about that, mm. if you don't mind? Um, well, I've had situations where people have uh, perceived me as a kind of shadow form. It's usually uh, when someone sees one out, someone out of body, they usually see like a kind of shadow shape, um, humanoid shadow shape. Uh, uh, the most, the most. I mean, I mean, with me, it's just literally they've seen like a shadow form moving uh, through like where I lived or something like that. Hmm. Um, and I also had an experience where someone saw me um, when I was out of body. I went through it was in Marble Arch, which is a very sort of rich, um, ornate sort of part of London. And I moved into one of the big white marble buildings there and went into a, a large sort of lounge area and a woman, uh, Arabic woman came into the living room and seemed to see me and put her hands up in the air, like a kind of Muslim prayer and sort of oh, reacted very, very strongly scared. to me. Um, yeah, I, I obviously did scare her. I, I, I wasn't able to track her down, but, um, that was, that was an interesting experience. I haven't had, something like that very often. Um, but then with the, the shadow forms, I've, uh, it was interesting because people said to me, did you have an out of body experience and come to that house on that time? And I, I, I had, so it was, I, I did, I was had no awareness that they'd perceived me, but it was interesting afterwards. Um, and then for example, one, one girl I worked with, uh, many years ago, she had an experience where, she went to her boyfriend who was actually quite a skeptic and uh, he perceived her like and even perceived what she was wearing. He told her over the phone a little while after um, what he'd seen her wearing and it was actually what she was wearing that day. Um, so that that's an interesting one. And then another one, one of my clients had an out-of-body experience with his his child um, where he went into the kitchen of his home and he and he'd been teaching his children how to have out of body experiences as well while I was teaching him um and the little boy also had an out of body experience and they met in the kitchen wow. and they they both perceived each other as shadow figures and they um in the morning um the little boy came running into the kitchen to tell his father that he'd had his first out of body experience huh. and that he'd seen He'd seen this tall shadow figure, um, and so yeah, they the little boy wrote the whole thing out and drew a little picture and sent me it. So <laughs> I've, I think he was 
he was very young. He was like under 10, I think. Wow. Wow. Okay. Um, that is, that is really cool. Man, this stuff is so cool. Uh, 336 area code. You're on the air with Graham Nichols. Who are you speaking with? Hey, this is Eric. What's up, Eric? I had a couple questions, if I might. Yeah, we got to we gotta get to this list, you, but yeah, let's hit, what do you got? What you got? Okay, you mentioned that there was a, a difference in brainwave pattern between the lucid dream and the out-of-body experience. My first question is, did they follow in the, the usual three categories, alpha, beta, and delta? And my corollary is, by generating, or could you artificially generate or stimulate those specific brainwave patterns and create the experience from that reliably? Say, hypothetically, if beta waves were what was going on with the OBE, if you generated, artificially generated beta waves in the test subject's brain, would they have an OBE? That's Hmm, that's a good question. I don't know if, uh, do you know anything about that? If they did generate the brain waves, I, I don't know. Um, well, w- w- with, with the, with the research, the, the early research going back to D Scott Rogo, um, that was mainly done with sort of EEG and it wasn't, wasn't particularly advanced, but he just, he just monitored the patterns of say a dreaming state and then compared them with the patterns of an out-of-body experience state so they were that wasn't uh, super advanced but it showed a distinction then later on there's been quite a bit of research since into dream states and there's been fmri scans of dream states and now uh, a few years ago there was a like i mentioned a study in canada where they looked at the um brain activity in a in a girl um in an fmri scanner so if you can you compare those um, again, you can see that the parts of the brain that are active and the, what's going on in the brain is very distinct from the research that's been done into mm. into dreaming states. So there's a there's a clear distinction in not just one area of research, but multiple um, areas of of looking at at the brain state. In terms of um, can the patterns be used? Um, I mentioned Michael Persinger earlier. He's been doing. Well, he, he he passed away recently, but he was doing research where he was trying to amplify different states using uh, his God helmet, the Corrin helmet, yeah. uh, which is a sort of device designed to sort of stimulate uh, the brain with magnetic frequencies. So he's been doing a bit of work with that. There is also research um, that suggests the temporal parietal junction in the brain, um, if stimulated um, magnetically, again, sort of interrelates with um, Michael Persinger's work. And it's a researcher called Olaf Blanke. Um, they've done work where if you s- stimulate the uh, um, the temporal parietal junction, you, you get... Um, you get basically something along the lines of an out of body experience, but no one, no one's found a way to consistently um, stimulate an experience because mm-hmm. I think the issue is what you would use to do that. We we only have say the um, magnetic stimulation, um, transcranial magnetic stimulation is what they've been using, and that that seems to be fairly effective, but in in creating something, but it's not guaranteed that it's going to be an out-of-body experience. So I guess with my infraliminal sound, I've also been trying to reproduce those brain states or at least the vibrational state. I think something that stimulates a full out-of-body experience might be quite problematic because it would be, it would maybe be <laughs> like too, too physically aggressive. Yeah. Aggressive, yeah. So I, I think, I think focusing on something like the, the vibrational state or something like that is a better a better sort of approach to to go with so that's why with my sound frequency technology i focus on on that uh specifically because then you're in the the launch pad to the out body experience basically um, um okay on. yeah let's go let's, real quick what's your next question there uh eric that was a good question by the way 
Well, I'm wondering, you know, in a lot of the literature and a lot of the, just say, the urban myth around this phenomena, a lot of attention is paid to the pineal gland. Did you find that anything to do with the pineal gland, or is this just another one of those things that back in the 60s, somebody mentioned, like Muldoon might have mentioned it, and everybody's carried it forward without really doing any research into whether it's valid that the pineal gland has anything to do with the out-of-body experience or these enhanced or, shall we say, states of consciousness, separate yeah. states of consciousness. That's a good question, too. Yeah. What do you think? Um, the pineal gland is a, is an interesting one, actually, because for for a while I did think that it might be one of those sort of urban legend type things. But then I started to find that certain depths of experience um, related to the out of body experience. So, like for example, uh, melatonin release, which we know is produced in the the pineal gland, seems to have a relationship with out of body experiences. As I was mentioning, the sort of moon and the sun and all these kinds of things earlier, I think there is some kind of a relationship with our internal body clock, which has some relationship to the out of body experience. We don't know exactly what's going on there yet, but I think that when you do um, interrupt your natural cycle or you do something like maintain darkness um, when uh, when you would usually be in daylight, for example, that seems to have an impact. So, so I think melatonin seems to have um some relationship and then there's ideas that there's sort of um well they what people have nicknamed things like metatonin um which probably relates to dmt and dimethyltryptamine um anthony peak is very interested in this idea uh, at the moment i'm not sold on it but um there is evidence of dmt production in the brain um and the most likely candidate for where dmt would be produced would be the pineal gland um because it has a relationship with melatonin etc so it there could be some relationship going on there that could be related to the pineal but it's very much at a sort of infancy proven, right? stage yeah it's not I mean, proven. We, we, we don't know for sure yet. But but there's there's evidence that points in that direction, I would say. Thank you uh, for the call. Our resident Fringe FM mad scientist, Eric Markham, very good questions. All right, so I want to finish this list here, and uh, let's see. Okay, number 15, interactions with physical structures, especially electrical devices. OBEs can be accompanied by interactions with the physical environment, while, again, this is rarely, if ever, described as a result of lucid dreams, near-death experience researcher Dr. Penny Satori has found that many near-death experiencers describe affecting electrical devices on an ongoing basis after their NDEs, and she is currently researching the phenomenon. Further, I have found no examples of this related to lucid dreaming. And I will add to that, too, that Doskalos himself um, talked about how he could move objects doing this, but he called it eczematosis, the out-of-body experience. He called it a different thing. But, yeah, that's a very good point. Have you interacted with uh, physical things or electrical things in your out-of-body experiences? Not so much in them, but as a as a result, sort of after them, um, there seem to be um, electrical malfunctions and things like that, the type of thing that's often associated with, um, you know, ghost phenomena and things like that. Um, so I've had a lot of that kind of thing, um, malfunctions and things like that. And uh, like I mentioned there, um, Penny Sartori is a um, a friend of mine and she's uh, spoken at some of my workshops and things like that. So um, I'm very familiar with her work and she's really fascinated by this area because um, she's one of the leading researchers in the world on this topic. Uh, if people in the U.S. aren't so aware of her, Penny Sartori is really worth looking into if you're interested in near-death experiences. She's written several books on it, and um, she did a five-year study in the U.K. where she um, found veridical evidence for perception while out of body or you know near death. So her work's very interesting, but... As an extension of that, she found that many of the people she directly studied, it was, you know, she was literally there in the hospital um, 
you know, in directly interviewing these people. She was working there at the time. Um, so she, she found that a lot of people afterwards had, uh, consistent, um, unusual experiences with electrical devices and objects and things afterwards. So yeah, it's, it's, it's an area that's not often talked about, but it's something that I think does happen to a certain percentage of out of body experiences as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's something that's quite distinct from anything I've ever heard about related to dreaming. Yeah. And with, and here's another thing too, to pay attention to a lot of, uh, paranormal researchers say that when they know there's a haunting or, or, ghosts or anything like that there there's always seems to be some type of electromagnetic uh stuff that happens also wires and bulbs have dimmed and yeah it's pretty mm. that's pretty interesting okay um let's see out of, a 16 out of body experiences uh occur when no discernible brain activity is present during an nde uh if this form of obe were a dream we would expect brain activity and signals of dreaming would be observable but naturally when a cardiac arrest has occurred, this form of brain activity is not present. This is consistent with research by Dr. Pim Van Lommel and others. Pretty good point. Uh, that one's pretty well self-explanatory, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and the last one, the number 17, the reality check test used in lucid dreams to confirm you are dreaming is based upon the fact that things break down in a dream state when focused upon. For example, Dr. Stephen LaBerge found that 95% of the cases of viewing text for the second time within a lucid dream caused the text to break down, and some 75% on the first viewing. This is rarely, if ever, reported in OBEs or NDEs and has never happened in your OBEs, Graham. Very interesting. Thank you for that, man. That's pretty fascinating stuff. And um, I put that Very article... <laughs> yeah, man. Like, this is... This is an article I wish I'd have found a long time ago, as I said, but I spread it all over the place, and we're going to put it in the show notes, too. But um, my last question would be, and we got to make it quick, is I have, when I was obsessed with having the out-of-body experience, okay, I was also just starting the neophyte stuff of the Golden Dawn. Now, I tried many times using many, many things to have an out-of-body experience, and it just so happened when I started doing the banishing rituals, that I did have that really big, huge out-of-body experience I told you about. Now, I know that you say there's no evidence for this, the energetic body and the kind of Robert Bruce stuff, so to speak. However, do you think that these could possibly be interrelated? Do you think that ritual could have had something to do with the fact that I did make that one launch and others of it said they've had the same things? Ritual, 100%. Um, I don't think we need to make the assumption that because you're doing the lesser banishing ritual or the pentagram that it directly has to do with energy see that that that's that's sort of like a jump um we know that doing a, a ritual has an impact both physically and psychologically physiologically essentially um so doing something like that consistently is going to have uh, a benefit and, a, and an effect. I don't discount that it could be an energy. There could be an energy for sure. You know, there's long been talked about chi, ki, prana, etc. Um, but at, at this point in time, we don't know what that would be. And the it does seem unlikely that that there is a another energy that we haven't yet discovered and. Um, so I tend to lean more towards that it's maybe some low level structure of, of reality. And when we do a ritual of that kind, it will, it will have that kind of impact. And I would point out that, yes, it's it, when I, when I did the lesser banishing ritual with the pentagram and on a consistent basis, it was beneficial to me too, but so was, you know, just doing sensory deprivation, basically anything that would have an impact on my conscious mental state had a, had an impact and a positive impact. And, and I found, I found, for example, uh, 3d visualizations in my book, my second book. Um, I talk about 3d visualizations as a way of, of working with this kind of thing. And they seem to be very effective as well. So it's, I, I think it's more the complexity of the mental process uh, that's key rather than gotcha. um, an energy as such. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Um, 
Wow. Okay. So let's let's recap on everything that that you have to offer, which is something totally different than I've experienced uh, with other out of body guests. First and foremost, I would say, guys, Infraliminal is on the website at grahamnichols dot com. There's a really good deal on it right now, um, and it's patented. It's his stuff. Uh, Infraliminal package discount waking and sleeping tracks. It's fifty five. Uh, looks like uh, gold British pounds here. That's still cheaper than what we get with other stuff. And then you can just get the vibrational state track for twenty five pounds, and then the deep mind sleep dream for thirty five. This is extremely affordable compared to other out of body stuff. I got to tell you so. You guys go check that out. The books, Navigating Out of the Body Experience, Navigating the Out of Body Experience, and Avenues of the Human Spirit. And here's the biggest one that I am very uh, interested in that that you have here is this, the Navigator Course. The Navigator Course, look, 8250 is the cost of that, man. I am guarantee this is probably worth more than that. So y'all jump on that when you get a chance. That's the Navigator Course plus the infraliminal recording discount that comes with it. And then you get, you can just take the course without the uh, infraliminal and that's extremely affordable guys. If you, any of you take this course, please tell me if it helped you because I can tell you by the outline, this thing looks really cool. And did I miss anything? Do you have any social media pages or events coming up uh, that you'd like to um, talk the, about? The other, the other thing is the uh, one-to-one coaching. So I oh, do yeah, coaching right. over, over Skype. So I can do that worldwide basically. Um, yeah. So that's the, that's, that's probably the most effective way to learn to have experiences in, in, in my in my research so um yeah and i have i have uh the usual social media like uh you know facebook and twitter and and uh youtube um although i may i think uh the main area is probably my mailing list and facebook if you want to keep up to date with what i'm doing i definitely will be and just real quick uh some of the key areas that he includes there's overcoming fear and anxiety and apathy relaxation and stress relief, building a personal profile of greater understanding. We all could use that. Understanding the vibrational state. Uh, this is something called the G technique in the multidimensional system. Even how to personalize techniques just for you and recognize them when you're close to having an out-of-body experience, how to leave the body, how to travel further, other levels of reality. All that stuff comes in with personal coaching as well. And, um, man, yeah, thanks for coming on the show and waking up so early in the morning in England and staying late night with us here in the States because this has been worth it to me, actually. This has been one of my out-of-body fave shows, I can tell you. Top 10 for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you. It's really good to have been on the show. Yeah, we'll do it again sometime in the future, maybe in a year or something. I'll wake you up at 4 and tell you, say, come on the show, <laughs> All right? But uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you again. Uh we got to get out of here, guys. Look, tomorrow night, Claude Swanson's coming on the program. Another fantastic guest. Please don't copy the show without written permission. You can also grab the show for free on any podcast player or app and YouTube, and we will have the member's site for the commercial-free stuff with extra content coming out soon. A big shout-out to Pacho, our producer, Don, Dennis, uh, Eric Markham, uh, program director, Jeremy Scott, all of you guys in the chat room. Coming up next up live on the Fringe FM is Ryan Gable and the Secret Teachings all night still here going on the Fringe FM. See you guys tomorrow night. Good night. Discretion is advised. Please don't jive me, don't you play me cheap. The day you do, they'll plant you six feet deep. Don't fool with me, don't fool with me. If you love me like you say you do, you won't have me a dozen others too. Don't fool with me, don't fool with me.